Okay, probably. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for um, coming tonight. I'm Kim DeSerpa, the board president for Pajaro Valley Unified School District, and I'm calling to order our board meeting tonight for Wednesday, July 27th. We'll start out tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance and Trustee Oscar Soto, would you mind leading us in the pledge? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if anyone here tonight needs interpretation, se habla espanol, please see our interpreter who's sitting over here waving her hand. She has an interpreter set up that she can give you. Item 3.3, our superintendent comments, and Dr. Michelle Rodriguez will be addressing the crowd. Yes, thank you very much. So today is a fairly exciting day for us because tonight we're going to have an update on our um, whole child, whole family, whole community initiative and also on our wellness center. Um, today uh, was released our podcast through Ed Trust West. So Ed Trust West has a new process. They have a new gallery in which they highlight districts throughout the state which are doing really incredible incredible work and so um, Chrissy who's going to be presenting alongside me um, and myself we were part of this podcast and so Alicia is going to be sending it out um, to all of our members but this right here is just the um, brief of it of what was happening and so I just wanted to let you know that we've um, really had a lot of positive interactions and a lot of positive recommendations recognition on the work that we're doing um, in line with whole child, whole family, whole community. And so this came out today and then on Friday and Saturday of this past week, I also um, was on the CSBA leadership panel and um, presented to about 500 people in regards to our work um, with family and um, parent engagement. And so um, I appreciate all the staff that always puts efforts towards ensuring that we are supporting our entire system so that our children can be college, career, and life ready. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. And next we move on to governing board comments, item 3.4. And we'll start with Jennifer Holm. Thank you, President DeSerpa. Um, let's see, so I've been doing some site visits, went to Rio Del Mar Elementary, looking at some of the various projects that are going on there, and then you know, talking about some of the ones that you know, still uh, need doing. And um, also attended our Pajaro Valley Education Foundation meeting and getting very excited about our 5K event coming up in October, on October 30th at Pinto Lake. It should be a lot of fun, and um, hope people can join us for that. Thank you, Trustee Soto. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, attending tonight. I want to extend a couple of thank yous, uh, one to Dr. Rodriguez and uh, Ramon Gomez for uh, brokering a conversation with the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, unfortunately, I was unable to attend. I had to take my daughter to the airport that day. Um, she flew out to Italy for a week, so I had to send her off. But um, thank you for getting that conversation started, and hopefully we can get that program going and get it underway, not only in Santa Cruz County, but Monterey as well. Thank you. Trustee Orozco. Yeah, good evening, everyone. So it's been a busy summer for me so far. Um, I also attended the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation 5K, and as Trustee uh, Holm mentioned, we're getting ready for our 5K event, which will be held October 30th. Um, we also had a green team committee, and I got the opportunity to um, chaperone at a Freedom Elementary School field trip. We actually took kids, second graders from Fremont Elementary and we walked down to the cinema 
So it was a re just a really neat opportunity to uh, interact with students and teachers and other parents who volunteer um, for that field trip. And I also uh, was invited as a guest speaker to speak to our Summer in the City students here at the district. And so they got an overview of what it means to be a board member, what we're in charge of, our priorities. And um, I got put on the hot seat. So they had some amazing questions. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Um, so it was very enjoyable. It was a really nice way to connect with them. Um, and just now I attended the Empower Watsonville mural reveal. And this is a mural that was done by students here locally in representation of just their diverse backgrounds. And it was just a very empowering experience, I think, for them and for the entire community. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Trustee Shocker. Thank you, President DeSerba. I also attended our Pajaro Valley Education Foundation meeting. Um, or we had a green team meeting. I also attended Coalition for Clean Air. It's a multi-county effort um, to promote Clean Air Day in October. So we will come back with more fun things that we have planned for students and the district to celebrate Clean Air Day. Um, I had, was able to, I was supposed to meet, but I, my child was sick, but Dr. Rodriguez took over for me and met with the city um, at Starlight Elementary School concerning their repainting of lines and rezoning parking um, on the streets at Starlight Elementary. And parents, I think, will be happy when that is done. They'll have more places to park to drop off their children and a drop-off zone. And we'll have safe bike lanes and pedestrian walking lanes over there, so that'll be happening soon. We also had an intergovernmental committee meeting with the city of Watsonville, um, discussing parks, recreation, and then I was able to see the start of the Freedom Elementary mural. I've posted some progress pictures. I'll be there again this week to see where they're at. They are almost finished with that. And then um, able to help out with the Azteca soccer camp that was at the Freedom Elementary field um, that Pajaro Valley Sports Foundation worked with the district um, for that field. And thank you, Gina Castaneda um, and the probation, probation department for putting on a great event for our local youth. Thank you. Danny Dodge. Okay. All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here, and thank you for everybody watching. Uh, I just wanted to briefly say the progress at Mini Light Portables is going well. I was able to see it, so thank you trustees, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, um, Clint, for making sure everything's going smoothly. Um, it looks great, and the people in my area are happy to see that new projects are, are finally taking place. Um, I also like to thank the the city of Watsonville and the administration at Watsonville High School for making our streets safer. You know, they're putting more lines, you know, crosswalks, lights, um, solar panel, street lamps, and so I, I just like to thank the city of Watsonville for that, making sure our streets are safe at Watsonville High School. And today was an, an exciting day because my daughter left a charter school to sign up at Watsonville High School, so she's gonna be a sophomore, so. Here we go. So, <laughs> thank you. Congratulations on that. That's big news. Um, okay, I've been um, attending many Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance meetings. We are looking for a new executive director, and I am on the search committee. I'm leading that effort, and Erica Pettyes Chavez's um, boots will be very hard to fill, but we are. If anybody knows any fantastic candidates, please forward them to me, and I will be happy to forward them along to our search firm. Um, if you'd like to speak on any of um, the items tonight, you have to have your yellow speaker card into Ava, who is sitting here on the end. She's our board clerk. Um, prior to that item coming up on the agenda, so um, the speaker cards are in the back. Um, 
I wanted to point out that we have uh, former board member Doug Keegan here in the audience. Hi, Doug, and thank you for your service. We're very happy to have you back in the boardroom. Doug um, had the seat that Georgia Acosta now fills, and we really miss you, Doug. Um, I'd like to also thank Taylor's Office City tonight for their um, donation to the Emerald, is it to the Emerald Legacy or just to the district? Um, just to the just district. to the district, right? Just to our, our di not just, but to our district for four thousand one hundred twenty-two dollars and fifty cents. We really appreciate their partnership. And so tonight, I'll be asking for a motion to approve our agenda. I'd like to pull item 11.20 out of consent. It's not quite ready for prime time. I'll move to approve. Hold second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Abstaining? Okay, the motion carries. 501, thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, 601. Next up, we have approval of our minutes, item 5.1. This minutes were from June 22nd, 2022. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 601 with Georgia Acosta absent. Uh, next, we have a public hearing, 6.1, level one and level two developer fees and surveys. And this item will be presented by our CBO, Clint Rucker. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez, and the public for being here for the public hearing. This public hearing is related to our developer fees. Per Education of Code, we do need to bring our studies to a public hearing to show that we have done our due diligence and able to enact developer fees, both level one and level two. Attached to this, you'll see the developer fee studies for both level one and level two. The level one studies actually only require once every eight years. We did have one done back in 2020, which allows us to continue you to levy those fees as they're increased by the state board of uh, state allocation board every February. So the state allocation board in February did increase them. They increased our level one fees from 408 for residential to 479, and then they increased the commercial from 66 cents to 78 cents. And then our level two fees, which require a school facility needs analysis, and what that looks at is what it would cost to replace our facilities versus our bonding capacity, as well as how many portables do we have versus fully furnished buildings that are um, in-ground buildings. And we passed both of those tests, so we are able to enact those level two fees, which currently are at 538. Those will go up to actually 579. So this is a public hearing in order to answer any questions the public may have. Later in the agenda, you'll see that we'll have to approve both the studies as per the new law that was enacted in January of 2022, as well as the resolutions for those. Thank you. Do we have any speakers to this item? No speakers. Okay, any uh, board discussion or questions? Oscar? Uh, just given the fact the recent approval of some of the projects here in the city, are any of those fees gonna apply to this? So this will only be for anything that starts two weeks, actually, I think it's 15 days from the approval of the increase of fees. So our current fees will apply to those. To the current project's current yeah. fee? So the current projects will still have that 408 and that 0.66 for the, re or for the commercial or the 538 for the level two residential. All right. Trustee Holm. And just for the benefit of the public, it's like, so this is, you know, these are specifically for like facilities, you know, at our school sites, right? And what is the, the current climate for other um, ways of generating funds for facilities? Yeah, so unfortunately the governor's budget removed our facilities funding that we were patiently and hopefully awaiting. So developer fees is really one of the ways that we're able to either do new buildings or to improve buildings that have met their lifespan. Um, developer fees can't be used for things like generic routine maintenance, but they can be used if a building is no longer operable and maintenance will allow it to be operable uh, or to house students. Um, so unfortunately, developer fees is one of our big ways other than a bond to get facility dollars. 
yeah. and yeah. sorry to continue to answer your question I think um, it yes it has to be used only on facilities it can't be used on anything else salaries or benefits or things like that can it be used for deferred maintenance at all or, or no so no no so just for newer only for new whether it's new construction or as I noted any construction that would allow a building to be in use that is has met its lifespan okay um, what impacts do we see um, of, of this having like on the housing market so we enacted level one and level two developer fees last year um, typically in developers fees we see about three hundred thousand dollars in income we actually had two projects that we had brought to board to defer the uh, payments so they could build some low cost housing they will be doing the payments still but that was over six hundred thousand dollars in developer fees so we haven't seen the developer fees slow down the kind of big developers who have been coming in Eden housing was one of them that I met with and asked to defer fees um, they're doing some great low-income housing but they're still able to do it even with the developer fees and in speaking with them they were totally fine with the fees they just asked that we defer them till they finish their project to be able to get the houses faster which we were able to do okay thank you any other questions or discussion Can you answer the question, why are residential, why is the residential fees so much higher than commercial? It seems like that should be, that's a flip-flop type yeah. of Yeah, I wish it was the opposite as well. The reason being is the study, what the state allocation board looks at is the impact it'll have on schools. So it looks as residential will bring in students, which means for us who are in declining enrollment, while we're declining enrollment, each time new developments come in, we decline a little bit less, which means facilities that we may not be need if we declined more will now need so that's what they look at is residential brings in more actual students which has a higher impact on our schools and the facilities so Clint the money that comes in from the developers fees does it go into its own um, line item account absolutely and we do a presentation every year we actually need to do a presentation yearly as well as five years I do a presentation every year including the five year just so the board can continue to see what we've done over the past years this year um, we've paid for some modulars uh, that we had at Aptos High, Aptos Junior. We also paid for Cesar Chavez to have a new band room floor because that building actually wouldn't be usable. And then the big one I think that we were excited about was being able to use it for Duncan Holbert to get it the new portables that it got. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hearing. Item 7.1. Report and discussion item on Citizens Bond Oversight Committee. This is the review report. Again, uh, presented by Clint Rucker, our Chief Business Officer. Thank you again. Thank you again, President DeSerba, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez, yes. So annually, due to our Measure L bond, we are required to, pre to uh, present to the board, at least annually, on the progress or any of the improvements that we've done through Measure L funds. I do have the honor of having actually Doug Keegan here with me um, that I invited to be a part of this. Um, in reviewing the presentation, he was gracious enough to let me do the presentation, but he is here to answer any questions if people have questions for the Oversight Committee, so he is here to take care of those. So just to give some updates um, this year we did actually add two new members we had Richard Reed and Willie Yahiro who have both joined our bond oversight committee so we are fully um, staffed on that committee now we had two meetings this year we're required to only have one meeting a year we did have one in August as well as one in February um, we didn't have any major changes to our measure L projects the ones that have been approved already through the voters and had already been approved through school site councils were the projects that we've done this year so we didn't have actually any major changes to bring to COC um, the highlights are we did have Richard Reed elected as chair at one of them and then at the next one we were able to review our overall measure L spending and just give the COC an update we did have some really good conversations during our COC meetings just about do's and don'ts and if we go for future bonds what our COC could look like it was really good hearing from um, Willie Yahiro who as you all know used to be a trustee on this board he had a lot of information from both the board side and the COC side so it was great to talk with him so our Measure L audit, each year we have an independent auditor come in and do our Measure L funds separately from our normal audit. And as you all remember, I, pre I presented a few meetings ago about our Measure L audit. It did come in completely clean. We had no findings. So that was presented to the COC, and um, they, they also saw that audit and found that they approved of it. 
So here's some of the projects that we actually completed in 21, 22. I won't go through each one, but I have pictures, which I think is way better. So we do have um, Aptos Junior High, Paro Valley High, we have Bradley, yeah, Hall, Mar Vista, and then Renaissance, um, which is what we've been working on also for one of the future or current projects. So just to show some pictures so the board can see what we've done. We have the NPR modernization at Aptos Junior High. We have that beautiful new NPR. Tennis courts, I was shocked at this. I actually asked my executive assistant, Veronica, I'm like, did you go to the same place and take the pictures? Because it looks totally different. But it's great seeing PV High's uh, tennis courts look so much nicer now that they've been resurfaced. Um, this was earlier in the year, but we did do the baseball and softball field over at um, PV High. Of course, who can forget EA Hall with that beautiful new field. We've been loving it. I know that the site's super excited. If you haven't been out there, highly recommend you go see it. It's a beautiful field. So our current projects that we're working on really over this summer is we have new portables at Alianza. The parking lot at both Bradley and Hall are being worked on. We have the new classrooms, as Trustee Dodge mentioned, at Minty White, which we're excited to see. Renaissance has a painting and paving project going on. And then finally, Rolling Hills has some updates to their bleachers, which unfortunately I won't have pictures for because it's not picture ready yet. But Alianza, you can see the new portables coming in. Uh, before or after, they did lay that full um, foundation, which looks great. They have the portables coming in. Bradley, we had a little bit of a hiccup on working with the city, but the project's back on track. So we are doing that parking lot to give them a nice, fresh new parking lot. Hall District parking lot, that one as well we're working on. Minty White, you can see there taking away those old portables and bringing in those fresh new portables. And then Renaissance, you can see that beautiful paint job, which we also, as the board requested, were able to save those murals. And um, Herlindo was able to have his painter actually go out and put a coat on those murals to protect them. So that was great. Just a quick review of our overall remaining funds for Measure L. Um, at the moment, we don't have any planned projects, so we're still working with sites, reviewing their initial site plans, what they initially wanted to do, and reviewing the cost. As you all are aware with COVID, costs have skyrocketed, so some of the plans that maybe would have worked three or four years ago, unfortunately with COVID, we have to kind of rethink some of them. So sites are looking at that as we develop plans, and if we have to make any changes and they have to meet with their school site councils, we'll also bring that to the bond COC to talk about and discuss the changes. Okay, and then our next upcoming meeting for the Bond COC will be August 23rd, and we'll be talking about future projects, as I noted, using those Measure L funds, kind of what's in the uh, wings for all of those different sites, and if any sites have come forward with some changes they would like to make. One I can tell you right now that we already know about, the one I think I know is Starlight is looking to use some of their Measure L funds, hopefully to help improve that garden project and put in a shade structure, so that would be great. Okay, and I'm happy to answer any questions, or the famous Doug will answer questions as well. Okay. Um, are there, we've already, uh, there's, there's speakers. no speakers, right? Yeah, we've already, just, is there any questions that you'd like to ask to Doug or to Clint? Anyone here? Trustee Dodge, Jr. I would just like to say thank you, Doug Keegan. You know, I've known you and your children for many years, and you do a lot of great work for people in our community who can't speak when they want to. You know, um, I don't know if it's okay to talk about how you, the, the legal services you provide for people who want to be citizens and need help. So I just wanted to say that. You know, I, I know we talk once in a while, but I, I wanted to say it out loud in front of all of us here today. Um, you're one of the reasons why I became interested in being a trustee. And so I, I just wanted to say thank you for everything you've done for the city of Watsonville, our children, and our people. So I just want to say that. Thank you. Trustee Shocker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Keegan, for over helping oversee such an important bond to get a lot of things we're trying to do accomplished. Um, Clint, I'm going to go ahead and ask the question because I know I'm going to be asked this later on. Um, Pajaro Valley High School. <laughs> um, we had initially planned on trying to do a performing arts center, but with the skyrocketing costs of COVID and everything else, what do you think would be the cost to build something like that nowadays? 
So when I met with Ryan when I first became CBO, we talked about the PV High project. Um, back then, that was about two years ago. We had originally thought two to three million would be in the ballpark of where we needed to be. At the time, the last time Ryan had reviewed it, it was almost five million dollars, and that was two years ago. So I would imagine with roughly 40% increases, if not more, we're looking at 7.5 million roughly to do a project of that scale. Okay. So if anyone wants to sponsor Pajaro Valley's <laughs> Performing Art Center, we are taking sponsors for our wonderful Pajaro Valley students. Um, also, the last question was about Cesar Chavez Middle School. Didn't they have something else planned? I know we did the track, we did the band room, but I thought they were looking at something else. They have other projects that were initially in there. I don't know that any have been slated for to begin or slated that they do want to move forward with. I can check in with um, both construction as well as Ben Benavidez to see what their plans are for that money. They do have one of the larger chunks. So I can absolutely check into that and get back to you. Thank you. Of course. Trustee Holm. I just wanted to extend my thanks to the committee for, for their work, um, just having the citizens be actively in, in involved and engaged in this bond. It has been such an, an incredible amount of work to have that kind of oversight, but it's so important to make sure that the, the intent of the bond was fulfilled. And you know, as a trustee and even before then getting to go around the district and seeing, you know, how the, the promises of that bond have been fulfilled and the projects and what they, we've been able to do with that has been exciting and thank you for the work. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Trustee Soto? No, okay. Um, I, I think I would like to point out that we've never had any findings in any of the audits that we've ever had on this Measure L bond and I think that um, hopefully we'll instill trust in our community if we ever need to go out for another bond. We would like to finish the Pajaro Valley campus for sure and we know that when we went out for the first bond we needed about 300 million at that time. We only received 150. We went out for 150 and received that so we do need quite a bit more money to um, bring our facilities up. Um, I think as a board, um, you know, we should do all we can to set aside whatever monies we, we possibly can um, to improve our facilities, but we likely will need to go to the community again at some point. I want to thank the committee for the service um, in uh, oversight of um, the projects and for their collaboration with our district and administration. Thank you. Thank you. So next we, yeah, good night. Next we have um, a wonderful presentation by our superintendent on a whole child, whole family, whole community, a district-wide focus update. Yeah, thanks so much. So Chrissy is going to be doing this presentation alongside. He gave it to me. Um, and I'll just all so be doing the first the first portion, and then she's gonna take over from that. So just so that everyone knows, um, I know you've seen this document quite a bit, but it's always I think is important that we go back to the LCAP goals that the board has set for us and the core values in which we established with parents and staff um, about three years ago now, and so. We when you look at the LCAP goals and you think about our focus on whole child, whole family, whole community, you actually see that representative in about five of our seven goals and in the majority of our core values. Um, and so when we are thinking of new projects and we're thinking about how do we want to best serve our families, this is what we always go back to and how we always support. And so we have have been trying to be forward thinking for several years. So one of my goals as superintendent is always for us to be doing cutting edge projects that are 
more spectacular and innovative than those around us. And so part of that is our recognition of the whole child actually started in 2019. So now everyone's talking about whole child, but for us, we, it actually was within our state of the district um, now three years ago, or yeah, four, three, four, four years ago. So um, we are now expanded that to whole child, whole family, whole community. And I will say CDE um, actually took on the whole child, whole family, whole community about six months after we started coining it. So it's spreading throughout the state as well. So when I often have people say to me, so what does that actually mean? When you say whole child, whole family, whole community, why is that so important to you and, and why do you even talk about it? And I think what we have shown is that we really need to look at the holistic development of our students. So when I got here, we did have a significant, significant focus on academics. We actually haven't wavered from that. But we also know that in order to have students truly accelerate and be successful in life, um, we also have to be looking at their holistic development, which means that they believe in their worth, um, that we're helping them discover their passions, interests, and talents, so we talk a lot about that. Um, and that also we're helping them to develop skills, competencies, and identities that they can take through life. Um, and we want them, the, the purpose of looking at whole child, whole family, whole community is just our recognition that the limitations and the challenges within the family unit, whatever that family unit is, does highly impact our students. And we talk talked earlier several months ago about dysregulation um, and we know that that family unit, whatever that family unit consists of, it doesn't actually have to be a mother and father, it can be a grandparent, it can be a foster family, um, whoever is caring for that child um, does have direct and high impact on that child's success. And so we believe in the asset mindset, looking at how can we take the strengths of each and every person within our ecosystem and really leverage that so that voices, assets, and experiences of our entire community are seen within the initiatives and the projects in which we do. Um, and so we believe that academic success is built off of um, cognitive um, competencies and identities, so we focus heavily on that, but also personal and interpersonal. So when you think of some of the new projects that we've done, whether it's the gardening instruction with Life Lab, the expansion of Food What, um, our support with our expansion of PVPSA, those are all because we we believe that those skills and those identities and competencies will help them to be successful academically. Um, and this is something um, that we're going to be actually focusing on pretty high this next bullet this upcoming year. So if you've already emailed me in the last couple of months, a couple of weeks, you'll see we have our new logo on there, which is, um, and our new theme this upcoming year is Together We Lift Up. And LIFT actually stands for Learning and Innovation for Transformation. But part of that is um, not only knowing, respecting, and valuing um, the interests and goals of students and families, but also holding high expectations. So there's a term called warm demander, right? Where that means high expectations, high supports. Um, and so we really wanna focus on that this upcoming year, but the fact that every single person within the system is going to be helping us to really support um, the children within our system. And so we're continually realigning our time, attention, and resources and energies um, to whole child, whole family, whole community. So that's not going to go away. Um, you're going to wind up um, continuing to, to hear that pretty, pretty significantly. And so this is, just so you know, this is actually, what I try to do is connect the dots. Sometimes people think that what we're doing is actually not connected to each other, but it's actually very aligned with where we're going. So something in the almost now six years that I've been here, my goals actually have only, they've deepened, but they actually haven't changed. 
they've actually just continued to accelerate forward. And so this graphic shows you um, where we've been going since 2019. So if you look up at the very top, it just talks about we really started the redesign and infusion of arts and CT programming, again, aligning it to passions, interests, and talents. In 2020, during the pandemic, we really we started the Greater Pajaro Valley Talent Compact with 60 of our community partners. Um, and so we those right there, I won't go over them, but those are the priorities that we established with those 60, um, it, that 60 partner ecosystem. In 2022, we also were one of the school districts that were off, allowed to be part of the CEI initiative or the community engagement initiative. And so we're really proud of that, that with the focus on authentic partnerships and again, the importance of whole child, whole family. Um, then if you look from the top down, um, in this past year, this year we went after the planning grant for community schools, so we received the planning grant. So starting next month, we will be able to really start that planning with our community of who, which schools are they going to be, and how are we gonna do those four pillars that you see right there. Um, we opened our first family engagement and wellness center, which I'm gonna spend very little time on, because Chris he's going to be speaking to that. And then what we started this summer, which was um, really a wonderful thing. So 3,000 students received more than nine hours a day of enrichment and academic acceleration um, at our schools. And so we're going to continue to be providing that. Um, and so one of the flagship examples of whole child, whole family, whole community is our wellness center. And so Chrissy is going to go ahead and support that. I do want to publicly thank Chrissy for the work that she did. So her title is actually the coordinator of counseling services, but because we did not have someone else to do it, she has taken the wellness center and really made it um, one of her passion projects. And so I appreciate her work. I am ooh, I am honored to uh, co-present with Dr. Rodriguez on the PVUSD Family Engagement and Wellness Center and how it embodies the whole child, whole family, whole community. So um, this is just sort of an overview to remind people uh, in and solidify in what the Family Engagement and Well and Wellness Center is. Uh, the PBSD's Family Engagement and Wellness Center it represents a collaborative model um, supporting students and families' health and social service needs at this one-stop shop. That's one of the key factors here. We want families to come to the Wellness Center who need any kind of help and that we can wrap them up and help them as best as we can. If we don't have the service there, we're gonna find the service, we're gonna guide them, we're gonna help them. The Wellness Center offers a continuum of care approach for PBUSD students and families through a multi-agency, multilingual, and multicultural wraparound support and service model. PBUSD is providing direct access to the Healthy Start program and mental health services, services just to start, and community partners provide direct services, including PBPSA, Salud para la Gente, Community Action Board, and Second Harvest Food Bank. Um, together, our agencies offer students and families access to a food co-op during all operating hours. PBUSD and agency staff provide information, connection, services, and referrals to meet the social, emotional, mental, and physical health needs of our students and families. So that's just sort of the rewrap. If for those who maybe haven't heard of the Wellness Center, people listening and, and um, watching, there's our, 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 our basis in whole family, whole child, whole family, and whole community. So I'm gonna go through a little timeline and then a few pictures 
just to talk about some of the things that happened. My December got messed up right there, but that's okay. Um, so in December 21, when we opened, we opened with our main partners, PVPSA, Second Harvest Food Bank, and the uh, Saturday food distributions, which are still happening. Uh, Luna Isol, a subsidiary of um, Community Action Board, having uh, um, small groups. Sa Salud para la gente. And if you remember, one of the first big things we did was the COVID test when all of the cabinet came um, and handed out COVID tests to all of the students of PVUSD right before uh, the second semester started. In March, we added Martha's Kitchen, which is the frozen meals. We still, every Friday night, hand out frozen meals between four and seven, and it's the popularity is going, uh, rising and rising. Salud have fit and healthy classes on Saturday, which were based in, um, they were based in um, recovering attendance. So we, we found students that were behind in attendance at EA Hall. We gave them Saturday school. Salud para la gente put on fit and, fit and healthy classes two, two Saturdays in a row. Um, and there were three different sets of that. Um, we added a Mixteco liaison and um, Luna y Sol started doing their parent nights. By May, uh, we were doing, uh, in partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank on our Saturday food distributions, we started including Inspire and having um, vaccinations. Tons of people were coming, getting a bunch of food and getting their vaccinations. And Inspire was giving a lot of them also like gift cards. So it was like a good day. Community, we were, we were getting a lot of things that day, those days. Um, and then a, a nice uh, connection with uh, food services, PVUSD food services. I don't know if you recall uh, in, back in May when they had that recipe of the strawberry salsa and they made the cutest video with the kids making it and then they sent it out to the families. And then if the families came to the wellness center to pick up the ingredients for that. That was a great opportunity for many families to learn about the Wellness Center who had not learned about it before. So any opportunity like that when we can get families in to realize it's not just for certain families, it's for all our PVUSD families. By July now, we've been having some summer groups. PVPSA has been wonderful with, we identified some students that needed a little more intervention, sort of tier two, and they've had three different groups of uh, small groups for about four weeks at the Wellness Center. It's so wonderful to be there when there's um, a bunch of youth and students there. Um, Empower Watsonville spent a week powering up, maybe talking about how they were doing that mural. Great to have them there. And when they're there too, they start thinking about, hey, how can we help? How can we volunteer? Uh, we started the Outdoor Science Workshop mobile van as well in July. Um, our Food What partnership, they have a farmer's market on um, on Tuesdays from four to six with the with the food that our students grow, grew and harvested. They come out there, they sell it, and it's only one dollar for like an organic bunch of the best vegetables ever. You'll see a picture. Um, and then some stuff upcoming in the works. Uh, we have a couple different parent uh, um, classes in the works with two different organizations, Disciplina Positiva and Triple P. We're still working out some of the details, but those are coming. Uh, Community Action Board is just about ready to get someone in our first module who can be there at a designated time for support for uh, legal services, um, which is very exciting. And you know, one of the most exciting things, uh, the laundry tokens. So we always talked about all this laundry service and it's actually more in, more intense to get laundry machines there than you think. And so quite a few people from different angles had this idea, Michelle, Dr. Rodriguez was one of them, and other people too, to, to do tokens. So the tokens have arrived. Um, we will first focus on our Healthy Start families to give the tokens either at Hearth and Healthy Start locations and, or at the Wellness Center. And they'll be able to take those tokens, go to the laundromat, and not have to pay for those loads. And so we will be continuing that program. Um, and then second harvest, um, I'm sorry, salud para la gente. The mobile services are on hold right now due to staffing. So these are to be determined. I will go through these pictures kind of quick. I just put them in because I think people like pictures, right? So everybody's, yeah. <laughs> um, we, uh, so here's like an example of the demolition of portables, which we had to... Um, they were not usable and were made room for the mobile services plus parking. It's almost all the way finished. There's a picture of some of the, the frozen meals from Martha's Kitchen and the freezer in the middle. I don't know if this points. Um, 
There's uh, some of the kids on a, a, a Fit and Healthy Saturday class. Um, on the bottom right, there's kids signing in. We have kids and families sign in through the computer with their ID number and our five-star program to track all the data and know who's around there. We have the um, it underutilized resource we have is the, I call it the free Kinkos. Um, not to advertise for Kinkos or anything, but it's like for families and students, they can use computer printing, scanning, anything, like if they don't have access to a computer or they need help with a computer scanning, filling out a form, we got them covered. Come and let us take care of you. Also, you the ribbon cutting event, many of you were at that. Here's a picture, that's that gorgeous organic produce on Tuesdays from four to six with our PBUSD students. There's Empower Watsonville. And down here on the left is one of the, the small uh, boys groups that happen in Module C, which is the, the, the mental health um, module where our mental health clinician is for, for counseling services and crisis services. So I'm gonna go through some of this data. Some, my next slide is really small and I apologize, but so the, the, the data that I'm gonna go through is gonna be a little bit quick. This one is mostly to show you um, yes, there's a couple schools just by how close they are to the wellness center that are that um, serve more of our students. But I want the point is to show you that all of our PVUSD schools have families coming to the wellness center. So the wellness center is serving 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 everyone, um, which is very exciting. And when we did it by grade, we did find that the the majority of students and family visitors were from the primary grades. Uh, this is the slide that I apologize isn't bigger. Uh, here, this is showing some of the services from March 15th through July 15th. Uh, as we're hearing from our community members, food insecurity is still an issue and most people are accessing food services at the wellness center, the majority. So the food co-op visit, also we have the frozen meals from Martha's Kitchen is the orange pie at 10.5%. And that's what we partner with Second Harvest Food Bank. So in module A, we go pick up all the Martha's Kitchen meals and then our staff over there hands out the Martha's Kitchen meals and then people can also go to the food co-op and get other groceries. So there's a mix of services there. Um, small groups, um, mental health clinician, et cetera, as you see. And this is, um, Second Harvest Food Bank data, sorry that title uh, wasn't like that on, on my computer. Um, <laughs> so uh, this is just showing the growth. This is in also including the families we serve on Saturday food distributions. So uh, June, Second Harvest Food Bank did not have Saturday food distributions and they were doing their inventory, so they had kind of a pause. People still came to the food co-op. There wasn't quite as much choice. We were, they were still open, but we didn't do the food distributions, which is why June is small. But you see that services are we're growing and growing and growing. We're being able to reach more and more of our PBUSD families and helping meet those basic needs so that the families, namely first and foremost, our students can thrive when they get to school. So as a wrap up, I'm probably over time. Since day one, back in December, um, 7,893 family service occurrences have been logged. Uh, we've been open uh, 1,280 hours. We have increased agency involvement with eight plus programs. That's eight more programs and we will continue. Again, keep sending us your great ideas and ideas for partnerships. Um, we continue to build community, making families and students' lives better. Always listening and staying responsive to their needs. And as we grow, we will continue to serve the whole child, the whole family, alongside families and the community. This last slide is really for the public. If people don't know how to reach the uh, Wellness Center, that information is there. Um, thank you so much. I, if there's time for questions, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Do we have any speakers? <laughs> it is a great presentation, to it be was. sure. We have one speaker, Chris Webb. Oh, excuse me.
Hi, I, uh, I think this is great, and I wanted to kind of go with it with, uh, to remind the, the board and, and everyone about something a student had said earlier this year, and it's something where I think if you were to explain to people like what is whole child, whole family, whole community, this would be the kind of idea that would make it easy to explain and really show that we're living up to our values. And um, you might recall when the student came, or, or spoke here, uh, she had mentioned uh, wanting to have teachers be able to bring in their kids if they come into some kind of childcare situation. And I feel like um, looking at the LCAP goals, that would go along with what we're kind of saying. We, if we really want students' grade level, I mean, I think there's no denying that you're gonna learn better with your actual teacher than with a sub. So if we're able to uh, meet the whole community, meet the whole family needs like that, I feel like that could be a really positive thing that would set PVUSD apart and we could be a leader. Um, I also feel like that could be something as easy as what we already did during the distance learning time. Remember we had the form? We, we wanted teachers in person so bad, we, were, we allowed the form and they were able to do that already. We could do that again that way. Maybe we do it with the wellness center. Or maybe we do a site level thing where students earn, um, they have like a work study program. Or, or where they begin like the beginnings of some uh, child development course that's you know tied into Gabriel or something. But I really feel like there is a lot of uh, ripe opportunity there. It's something where we could help retain teachers, we could help recruit teachers. We, I, I know from what I saw this past year with this, um, it, it's an easy way to raise expectations in the classroom. And I think also it's like there's no denying that it's one of those holistic development things for the whole class. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Do we have any discussion from board members or questions for Chrissy or Dr. Rodriguez, Trustee Hall? Hi there. Um, particularly uh, with the wellness center, you know, what kinds of impacts do you expect to see, like on on measures like um, average daily attendance or learning outcomes with with some of these initiatives? One of the things that we will be trying to utilize, as you heard about the fit and healthy uh, classes, so there's a, because we're open on Saturdays, it's actually a great place to have uh, Saturday schools to help recover some of that daily attendance. However, if the more we have small groups there, the more that students at sites are identified by not going to school, maybe because they're anxious or they're depressed, um, and they're identified quick enough to be in a small group and get some support and some sense of belonging, uh, the, the, the hope is that would positively impact them in attending school, performing better in school. Um, the, you know, we're in the building phases, so, but some of that, that the core, um, purpose of serving that that wellness, the mental health wellness of the student, can happen quite a bit at the wellness center and at the school sites. With the the wellness center, sort of a um, uh, a base example of how we can be running our small groups, but they can be at all the campuses. And that's you know, if we give our students a, a sense, a place to reflect, and a sense of connection and belonging in a small group, I, I we will see positive impacts. Just to add on to that, so Chrissy mentioned that we're using Five Star when they come. Mm -hmm. So we are tracking the students that are accessing these resources and we're gonna be able to parallel, to triangulate that data mm -hmm. with attendance, disciplinary, and also academic data. Mm -hmm. So we'll have some pretty rich data. Mm -hmm. um, we just started that you know, a couple of months ago mm -hmm. and so we'll be able to see that data pretty soon and be able to see, are they making a difference? If so, is there something that um, is making more of an impact than others? I will say that we are constantly listening, which is why you see the continual innovation. So the, the frozen food was a direct response from families saying that the, co the food co-op was not useful to them because they lived in an individual room with no access to a, a 
uh, no access to a kitchen and they didn't weren't able to take this good dried food they weren't able to do anything with it so instead what we did is we said okay how can we tackle that for you and they said we need um, frozen food which I just want to note Chrissy goes always 110% um, they also if the parent requests they will heat it up for them and so we are doing everything that we can in order to support families and we're listening and then adding on services um, to those responses. Any other questions? Trustee Dodge? I just want to say thank you, Chrissy. I've seen you in action. You know, I live a couple blocks away and um, Every time I direct people, students, you know, even my my daughter's grandma, um, you're always there. You know, you're always managing cabs, second harvests, these food demonstrations that I've seen. Um, I, you know, people are hungry in our area or the area that I represent, mm -hmm. and. You know, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, and you, you guys see, and you guys are listening to the people. You know living in a room and not having accident, you know, it's it, it, it's a big deal. And even laundry tokens, mm -hmm. you know, there's a laundry mat right right there on East Lake behind the, the field. You know, washing loads of clothes for $10 adds up, mm -hmm. you know, 10 20 30 $40 just to wash. Then you still have to dry. And so I think that's a great idea with the laundry tokens. And I just like to, you know, say thank you for everything you're doing, you know. I, I, I see it's like a community out there. I, I see you directing everybody where to go, what portable to see, and I, I just wanted to say thank you for what you're doing out there. Thank you, Trustee Dodge. And I, uh, as in a bittersweet note, um, as you know, uh, I'm the coordinator of counseling programs. I forgot to introduce myself, huh? But um, so uh, my position as coordinator of counseling programs actually um, no longer will be running uh, or helping manage the wellness center. As you know, you all hired Mr. Ben Slider to be the coordinator of student services, and we're having a good time doing a little bit of a handoff, and the baton is going to Mr. Slider. Wave to everybody, Mr. Slider. Um, and I expect uh, great movement and, and growth, and I'll be right there alongside him, and we'll be continuing to do all this wonderful work for our, our families and our students. I have a couple comments and maybe a question. Okay. Um, you know, with inflation and the housing crisis, it seems to me like through this wellness center, we're addressing many of um, the concerns out in the community, not concerns, needs, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems to me that as we continue uh, moving forward with other wellness centers, I think there's room for collaborating with the city of Waxonville and probably leveraging some of their funding in support of these wellness centers. Just because, I mean, we're, we're providing wraparound services, and yes, they're for PUSD families, but they're also residents here in the city of Watsonville mm -hmm. and outside. So I think that's an area worth exploring. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, um, you know, as Chris was mentioning, um, the work-study program, right? We do have the Summer in the City program, but I think it will be interesting to explore uh, some sort of internship programs throughout the year that can be... Uh, available to students who need that additional income. Um, I know that some do work at Target and Starbucks and so forth, but it will be really neat to just have them be exposed to professions, you know, within uh, the Paro Valley. Mm -hmm. um, so that will be something interesting to consider. Uh, and then my last point, um, I know Chris also mentioned it, but I think we did explore the possibility of childcare for our employees at my request years back. And that conversation started, but it just sort of, other, there were other priorities at that time. But I think it'll be interesting to just sort of um, have that conversation, look at possibilities, and see if something's feasible. 
So I probably read Chris's mind earlier, but um, we we actually are in the conversations with the now having UPK and possibly having some additional spaces within our preschool programs. We are having um, conversations about that. We just have to work with state on getting some waivers due to income waivers or some income requirements that we would have to get around. But um, it definitely is something to consider. I know housing would be another thing that we tried to tackle and that one is a harder nut to crack. Um, so this one is definitely um, something when I think of cost, I have a niece who has a one year old and I know how much it costs to for her to, you know, have to have care for for um, Cherry Grace. And so because of that, um, that is something that we're significantly considering. So so stay tuned, Chris. Question on Trustee Shocker. Um, just to kind of go on to Maria's point, um, with the Wellness Center in the city of Watsonville, it would be nice to have some information um, from city parks and recreation in there about programs that are offered for youth. I know one of the complaints I hear from parents a lot is they don't know what to put their child in or there's no programs for their child mm -hmm. to do besides after school programs. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to have that information available, especially since you have the computer there, um, have someone help sign them up for those types of programs. Um, so that they have that access and that's our wellness center can kind of be like the go-to point for the community right um, there was a news article this morning that the average family is paying um, over $500 a month for basic supplies um, as such as food and gas um, since last year so we're talking about a $500 increase per month for a lot of these families that are already struggling mm -hmm. so um, I'd like to see definitely our continuation of our food program and see if, what else we can do to be creative there with some more of maybe the recipes that you have doing that are easy for people to prepare that don't have access to a kitchen like Dr. Rogerie has said a lot of them living in rooms so just um, for us to be a little more creative uh, we've been doing great I love this project and um, would love to see more of it so thank you everyone for your hard work Are there, um, I'm guessing there are some types of health services offered at the wellness centers? With right. Is the partnership is with Salud para la Gente. So how are, what, are, what are they offering to this As of right now, um, we're still trying to figure that out. The okay. goal from the beginning was to have the mobile services. Uh, and they are having some staffing issues mm -hmm. to even just fill all of their clinics and keep them fully staffed. So they are putting, a, they can't give us an exact date of when we could have the mobile, the first one that will come will be the dental mobile services, but it's to be determined. And there is, of course, the the closed loop referral system that we have, that all the social emotional counselors use, and the mental health clinicians and the Healthy Start folks called NowPow. It's also used at the wellness center. So anytime anyone comes in, we can immediately at least make an appointment for them and send them to all those um, salud, salud para la gente services. But yes, I want them at the wellness center. <laughs> what, what are we hoping would be offered there in terms of health? Probably, right now, probably only dental is the one that they're talking about the most. We have been pushing on them, like why can't we get the medical mobile services if they just don't have the capacity to do it yet. But the vision is to have dental and sometimes have the the mobile medical services, which would be more like um, checkups and things like that. Uh, and you know, we, ha we do have the vaccinations and, thing and when Inspire comes. But there hasn't been a deep conversation about what exact medical um, services would be given the families as far as non-mental health services. Okay, I'd like to see some reproductive health services offered to mm. our young people, if possible. So that is, um, 
That's a possibility. There is a, a reproductive health mobile service van added to Salud para la Gente. They have stated a couple places they're going to put it. We're trying to convince them they should put it over there at the wellness center. They did, I, in a conversation with them, they are still trying to figure out if they can get a person, uh, a representative in the, the main module of the wellness center to be there at least for appointments and for our teens to talk with people that isn't necessarily going into the clinic to be able to come and make appointments and get you know pamphlets and things like that. Okay, well, great job, thank you. Oh, I have actually one more, one more question. What, who, how are we paying for um, the laundry service? Like, where is that money coming from? Um, we'll be using um, our one-time money, so we'll be using ESSER and um, some of our other one-time monies. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Trustee Dodge. Just to, to follow up on how you were talking about reproductive services, have we reached out to Planned Parenthood yet about that? Planned Parenthood is, is on our list. But we haven't been able to, and we've had a conversation about having someone in the, the module. They wouldn't be able to have the actual services there yeah, yet as, as we're equipped, but we have had conversations of getting them in the module. You know that first module, yeah, that's yeah. the, we're trying to get as many rotating partners like Planned Parenthood in there so that we can tell people, hey, Planned Parenthood's there at 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Tuesday and Thursday. Yeah, you know, exactly what trustee, mm -hmm. Well, President mm -hmm. Deserpa was saying, I think um, just some somebody they could turn to to kind of let the information like, hey, you know, Planned Parenthood provides these services, you know, like a handoff. And so I, I think that's a great point by President Deserpa. So yes, and there's so many families that come and visit for food services and other food services. That is a great way for them to learn about access to Planned Parenthood and other um, services. Thank you. Any other last comments, Dr. Rodriguez? No. No, okay, thank you very much, Chrissy. Thank you. Okay, um, next up we have item 8.1, our visitor non-agenda items. Do we have any um, speakers to 8.1? We have one speaker, Chris Webb. Um, I want to thank the board for and the and the district for their uh, deliberate and careful um, response with respect to the the murals at Renaissance and thank you for seeing that they're got that additional protection. Um, I, I think it's really I, I feel a lot better considering what happened with Watsonville and I feel like we 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 tried to do the right thing we did the right thing and I also want to. Um, say that I agree with Trustees Holm and Acosta about the prospective board policy they mentioned where uh, new murals would be put on removable boards or, or some type of removable thing so that we don't get in this situation because I, I don't like it either. I know you guys don't like it. Um, and I think ideally this type of issue should come up like from the site through the institutions we have there, leadership, staff, site council. There might be a summer where some you know community member is not able to come and speak and stop some potential uh, miscalculation. So if we can make sure we do it that way, then then we also ensure that we involve all the stakeholders and we're really living up true to the uh, whole community. Ideal plus the other thing I'm thinking about, especially as I have like a cut on my hand right now, like uh, you know as nice as the painting is. I'm still, you know, have concerns about the the chromium six issue with the water. Um, like I know we have the RO stations, but still, like what I wash my hands in, I don't I don't feel that that great about. So I I kind of want to know like how did we decide to do painting over connecting to Soquel Creek Water District? And I'm wondering if we might want some other additional board policies where we make sure that these type of issues come through our site level institutions um, and also maybe we make sure that our our site council meetings are um, run in a transparent way and and also that when there's expenditures over 50 percent of what we have that uh, uh, for a site they come they come through our institutions thank you thank you thank you chris
Moving on to employee organizations, starting with PVFT. Hi, Nellie. Hi. Ah, stabbing myself in the eye. Um, good evening, board. I can't look at you with my glasses on, they're only for reading. Um, happy end of the summer. Um, <laughs> so I, um, really nice presentation on the whole um, child, whole family, whole community. Uh, the PBFT, as as well as the CFT and the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, um, is founded on social justice, uh, and that is inclusive of all the people, not only that we represent, but the people that we affect, and the people that we represent are part of our community. And their students are some of our learners. Um, so it is, we too, also, our hashtag is together we rise. Um, so we're almost aligned. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so one of the things that has been mentioned uh, tonight is community schools. So I do want to um, thank Dr. Rodriguez for hearing us out, the PBFT, out on um, our request to pursue the community schools um, funding, and which they did. I was able to be a part of the brainstorming um, and Part, one of the foundational aspects of the community school is the um, collaboration between the union and the district in establishing the programs or the sites. Um, so we are looking forward to that. And another item that was mentioned by Chris and then um, Dr. Rodriguez spoke to it really briefly was the whole preschool um, access for our teachers. That was one of the, our last conversations that she and I had in June before I went on summer break. Um, and that was how do we address the issue or the concern of childcare, um, the cost of childcare for that our members um, face as young parents, especially if they're on the lower end of our salary schedule. So um, I do appreciate that that is something that um, the district is looking at because I know that with the TK or the pre-K program, um, reducing then the um, ADA for the regular preschool program, we can hopefully use one of those centers that eventually might be vacated um, to help with our um, teachers in, or our educators in, this, in, in our district. And I think that that would be very innovative. Um, kind of like Google, providing you know, daycare for their employees. Um, and then I just want to remind the board that, you know, as you are well aware, the state did pass um, a very um, generous budget. So overall, the LCF, LCFF funding is increased by 13% overall. You know, that's inclusive of our 6.56% um, in the COLA, and then the additional billions um, that go uh, to above that amount. And so there is there is a lot of money coming into the district, and I really hope, and you know, I'm not standing up here to say we want it all, but as part of that focus for a whole um, student in our community, it's important that we also invest in our students um, by providing them the educators they need and, you know, qualified educators they need in, in the classroom. So we had two comprehensive high schools here in Watsonville that lacked staff all year long. Uh, we still do lack quite a bit, uh, quite a few, we have quite a few secondary um, openings. I want to commend um, Brian and the HR department for really getting out there and pounding the pavement to get people hired because there was 200 over the course of this last year, 200 resignations and retirements combination. So there has been, I was looking at my inbox because I get the notices of um, who's going to be coming to orientations for new hires. And there's, I this morning, I think I had like 110 in my inbox. So there's been a lot of people hired just in the last couple of months. So it's great, but... And, and that's what, you know, so it's great. I'm, I'm happy, uh, <laughs> but we need sustainability. So we have wonderful programs that are being brought into this district. There are, there are some great things that our administration is bringing in, but we need the infrastructure and that keystone species is the educator. So, um, and we want them to stay. 
because um, that is most important. Uh, anyways, that's that's my spiel for tonight. Um, thank you. And um, I'm just going to add on my own personal note, when I came on as a first year teacher in this district uh, 16 years ago, um, my son they, was uh, going into first grade and my administrator would have me come to work with my son who would be incredible you know, if he was really ill and she's it was like look you can't be absent from work and I was a new teacher so I didn't really know my rights I was like oh okay I gotta hurry up and get to work because it, the expectation was put your son on the couch in your classroom and so then my fifth grade students would help me take care of my son. They loved it because he was little and they, you know, they were just like, oh my gosh, the teacher brought her son. But he wasn't disruptive, but he was sick. Um, but that's, you know, I'm not saying let's bring sick children to school. I'm saying if he was not sick <laughs> and, and um, for some reason his, I, I needed to bring him, he, you know, our, our, our children, they can adapt pretty well, and our students are always really thrilled to see Thank another you. aspect of our, of our own personal life. Thank you. Thank you, Nellie. Is there anyone here tonight from CSEA? Yeah, they're at conference, okay. How about anyone from Pavam tonight? Yeah. <laughs> Great, hi Richard. All right, good evening. Uh, President of the SERPA, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, I'm Rich Ariano. I am the proud director of the PBUSD Purchasing Department. And um, I'm actually going to take the time tonight to go through some of the things that, that our purchasing department does, um, highlight some of the work we've done over the last year that I think, uh, for me, I'm super proud to be a part of. Um, and I just want to make sure I set a goal for myself and our department this year to talk about what we do as often as I can with the thought that if, if you don't talk about the things you do and what's important to your department, people may just make up those stories kind of for you. So um, it's, it's great to have uh, a staff to work with that is super customer service oriented, that is always there to help. And um, yeah, so first and foremost, um, before any of the rules, laws, and board policies, they're all extremely important for what we do when we make purchases. The first thing that our staff focuses on is customer service. It's it's number one. It's, it's always gonna be, we will help you find what you need to purchase. Maybe we say, no, you can't buy that, but you can buy this, or yes, you can buy that, but you can't buy it the way you're trying to buy it. But we're always there to help work them work with them to find uh, the best solutions to um to whatever they're trying to find um, so the main thing that our staff loves about being in the purchasing department is that we get to work with every single school and every single department in the district I mean throughout the year there is not a single uh, site or department that we don't interact with and, and help out um, and we understand that that always has an effect on uh, teachers in the classroom CSE staff doing their work at, 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 at their sites and um, we're just there always for support so um, one of the things that a lot of people probably don't know purchasing department actually has three branches there's our main purchasing department here everybody's here at the district office but our purchasing departments here we have our main warehouse and then we have our district receptionist and one of the things that I like to do kind of at the end of a year is go back and look at some uh, kind of statistics some of the, sometimes the day-to-day -day stuff that we do doesn't really convey how much work we're actually getting done so uh, starting with our district receptionist Peggy Raymond she's in charge of our mailroom and she always hands me her summaries for how much mail she sent out. Over the course of a year, she sent out 88,000 pieces of mail, which translates to our department's taking advantage of that and saving around $3,500 in postage for a year. So that was something that surprised me. I know why she's always so fired up about everybody sending things in the correct way, the right envelopes, flaps down, do it right, or you will have from Peggy. Um, our, our, main, our main warehouse, um, is uh, Mark Healy, Curtis Fox, and Brandon Cobbs. And going through the receiving log earlier today, they brought in 25,000 packages through this facility last year. Unknown number of items within those packages, but their role is always to receive those items, check those items, ensure that everything is accurate for what we ordered, what was shipped, no damage. If there are any issues, they work with that vendor to correct it, and then to ship those things off to the sites and ensure that we can pay for those items. 
Um, and then our main purchasing department is comprised of um, our senior buyer, Carrie Marquez, our purchasing specialist, Grace Ramirez, and they processed uh, 5,100 purchase orders last year. So um, I'm also part of that team. I get I get to see all of those too, but they um, are checking for uh, the correct vendor, the correct pricing, making sure everything meets our standards and specifications for what we're gonna buy to make sure we're getting the best items at the best price in the best um, time. We also process all of our service agreements. A lot of the really high profile things will come to the board um, for individual approvals, but um, a lot of other things for um, performers at schools or professional development consultants. We, we look at those and work with our sites and departments to make sure that they're following all the rules and regulations to hire who they hire to bring onto their sites, that they are um, have fingerprint and background checks, COVID vaccinated, um, all of those things go through our department. So everything really that you see, desks, tables, chairs, that, that all goes through us to make sure um, that, yeah, that we're purchasing, that, purchasing everything the right way. Um, and then very quickly, just some of the projects that we were able to touch kind of this last year that, that were impactful across the district. Um, launch kits at the beginning of the school year to make sure that all students had a core set of uh, classroom supplies to start the year. Um, every year, purchasing and finance departments meet with every single site and department in January and February to go through their budgets and see their open um, expenditures and make sure they have a plan to spend out their money. We worked with um, our planning team, Starlight, um, and the uh, architects and contractors for the culinary garden and teaching kitchen project to order all the equipment for the kitchen, all the tables, chairs, um, appliances, uh, wellness center agreements, MOUs, furniture, and then all, won't go into deal, but uh, streamlining order processes, all the PPE we issued, um, COVID testing vaccine clinics, and then rapid tests will be available for all students and staff before the start of school this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. That was super comprehensive. I think that might be the first time we've heard from your department yeah. during one of these PAVAM presentations. Anytime, anytime. Yeah, it was awesome. It was super interesting. And thanks to, uh, yeah, thank you to your, your staff for moving that much mail and packaging. I mean, it's like your own little post office there. So <laughs> it's awesome. Anybody here tonight from CWA? Okay, moving on to our action items. This is item 10.1, developer fee justification study level one. Thank you, President of the Serpa Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. As I mentioned at our public hearing, this is now the time for the board to look at and approve our actual justification study. This is for the level one fees. This was a new law that was passed this year in January of 2022 that now rather than in the past, what we've done is we've taken them with the resolution to show that we did do the appropriate study. Now the board has to actually approve the study first. So the board is effectively approving that the study was done and was done um, and has all the information necessary. For this study, the level one is done by SchoolWorks. They also do our level two study. The study includes um, all of our demographics in terms of our enrollment, what our projected enrollment would be with and without um, new developments. And that's how they make the determination if we're able to charge the developer fees. So in doing their report, they did determine that increased development would increase enrollment and therefore we are eligible to be able to charge those developer fees at level one. Okay, I'm looking for a motion. I move to approve. Uh, approve. There's no speakers to this item. Oh, I'm sorry, no speakers. A second. First and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion carries six, z sorry, five, one, no, five, five. zero, two, with Trustee Soto and Acosta absent. Item 10.2, Resolution 22-23-03. Thank you once again, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Now is the time for the board to approve the actual resolution, which will allow us to increase the developer fees to the new state allocation board approved amounts for level one. Again, that's the 479 and the 78 cents for commercial. Again, that backup provided is also the study that, um, as I noted in the public hearing, is from 2020, but again, those studies are good for eight years. And what they allow us to do is to continue charge developer fee level one at the approved rates by the state allocation board. We have no speakers to this item. 
I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502 um, with Trustee Soto away from his seat, Trustee Acosta absent. Hey. Hello. Sorry. That's okay. I'm just reading it out. So, <laughs> so this is item, um, is it 10, are we on 10.3 now? Yes. 10.3, developer fee level two school facility needs analysis. Thank you once again, President de Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. This is now the level two school facility needs analysis. So unlike the justification study, the school, the school facility needs analysis actually has to show that in at least one of the four areas we have qualified um, to be able to charge level two fees. The two areas we did qualify is that 20% of our buildings are portables and that our overall um, facility needs are above the 15% bonding capacity that we could do to uh, support them. So that does justify those level two needs, showing that we do need that extra higher rate to be able to provide facilities for our students. Any speakers? None. Okay, looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 601, Acosta absent. And I've lost my place again. Is this 10.4, resolution 222304, developer fees level two, 20, 2022-2023. Thank you one last time, President Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So this is now the chance for the board to approve the resolution, which will allow us to implement those level two fees at the new rate of 581. Any speakers? None. Okay, looking for a motion. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstention? Motion passes um, 601. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This is item 10.5, realignment of classified management organizational structure resulting in a reduction in cost. Yeah, thank you so much. So. At, this is actually an extension of the May 11th board meeting. So at the May 11th board meeting, we had the discussion about how we were taking the funds from the fifth cabinet position that we dissolved, and we were going to apply that over several, several management positions, district management positions, with the goal of allowing for promotional opportunities and also aligning people so for example prior to this um, you would have you would see a discrepancy between the director of purchasing and the director of transportation and say um, the director of food services and so what this will allow is for allow there to be some parity similar to what we did with our directors and coordinators with the certificated the reason why this is coming back at a later time is as I noted at that meeting, so this is part of the original package. This is not added on, but this is what was part of the original still cost um, savings is that this needed to go to the personnel commission. So it couldn't be done at the exact same time. So um, it has now gone to the personnel commission. It went on June 16th to the personnel commission, was approved there, and so now we are bringing it back. As such, um, what happened with the certificated positions is the same with the classified positions in that they will be changed to the step. Um, so for example, the director of purchasing who you just heard from, he is currently um, at, um, he would be at, he's currently at a step at range 37, step six, which is all the almost all the way over. He would now become range 40, but he would go down to step three, which would be the exact same pay. So they don't necessarily get a pay increase right away, but what they do have now is they have the ability to, over time, as they're with us more years, they have more room to grow over time because um, many of them were at either a range six or seven, which meant that you were almost topped out. Um, and um, so I will take any questions. Any speakers? No speakers. Okay, any questions or discussion from the board? 
Just a clarification when you get a chance. Okay, go ahead, Trustee Shocker. Okay, so we approved this at the May 11th, 2022 board meeting. This was the restructuring where we talked about saving the district money. Mm -hmm. And for this current year, we're looking at saving almost $160,000 despite that, doing this changes and steps, correct? That's, that, that's that correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah. Trustee Holm? And just um, you know, as a reminder from that May 11th meeting, how do you ultimately see this structure change benefiting our students and the wider uh, community? So I think a system is always stronger when you allow for promotional possibilities. So this will allow for promotional possibilities where people will be able to go from um, a supervisor position to a director position and make significant and make more money and so want to be able to promote. Um, also, if we ever wind up losing any of these staff members, it will allow us to attract um, higher level people um, because in general, just as is often mentioned with staff, staff um, management also um, because we put great pride and commitment to our um, to our health and welfare benefits are necessarily our pay isn't always as good. Our total compensation is good, but when, or is fair, um, but when you look at a salary only, um, in general, we pay significantly less than, than other districts. Okay, any other comments or discussion? I move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Great. Motion carries 601. Thank you very much. Item 10.6 Expanded Learning Opportunities Agreement with the Central Coast YMCA. Yeah, so eventually you won't see the superintendent presenting these, but we needed to because um, we needed to move quickly and swiftly. So as was mentioned when I did the expanded learning opportunity um, plan, what we had talked about was having um, our, our PM kinder students have the ability to go to a community partner. Um, so what you're going to see in the next three um, items is the community partners that we were referencing. So this first one is YMCA. So YMCA is going to be able to support um, 80 students, 80 slots of programming. They'll be parents that have TK and kindergarten students from Landmark, Radcliffe, and Starlight will be able to drop off their children free of charge at YMCA, and they will be able to have support from 8 to 11. Around 11 o'clock, our buses will pick them up and will take them to their three prospective classes. Another thing that they'll be doing as you noted, as I noted in the plan, is we have six Saturdays in which we will be providing support and enrichment to students. YMCA will also be providing on each one of those Saturdays a hundreds free slot for day camps. So parents will be at one of the locations will be the YMCA. And so this is the cost. All of this is being paid out of expanded learning opportunities grant funding. One of the requirements of expanded learning opportunity grant funding is the incorporation of community partners. And so this well fits within that grant. And so I'm asking for your approval of YMCA. Any speakers? We have no speakers to this item. Okay. Uh, are there any discussion? I'll make a motion to approve. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone abstained or opposing? Motion carries 601. Next is 10.8, an expanding learning opportunity agreement with Campus Kids Connection for Valencia Elementary. Um, actually, we're at 10.7 with the City of Watsonville. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to move us along. Expanded learning opportunities agreement with the City of Watsonville Parks and Recreation. 
So very similar, I'll be fairly brief. It's the same context. Um, their capacity at the city of Watsonville Parks and Rec was 40, and so they will be providing 40 slots. This will be for Starlight Elementary and HA High families. And then they will also be providing one day camps. They said that they could do a capacity of 40. This will be at their youth center location here in Watsonville. Any speakers? No speakers. Any questions? I move to approve. A second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 601. This is item 10.8, Expanded Learning Opportunities Agreement with Campus Kids Connection for Valencia Elementary. So this is, a, this is slightly different. So currently, Valencia Elementary is supported by Campus Kids Connection. And so this at this point, because they did not receive 21st century learning grant funds, this was actually a paid program by parents. Um, part of one of our, if you remember, I guiding principles in terms of expanded learning opportunities was equity of access, equity of opportunity. So what we, when we say that, what we believe in is that every single school within our district should have these services, regardless if you're a highly resourced parent or or if you are a parent um, of vulnerable population. So what we have done is this Campus Kids Connect, or CKC, has built a really strong program that parents depend on and support. Currently, there's almost 60 parents who are signed up to be able to do this. So what we have done, and we will be bringing um, also Marvis says County um, program at the following board meeting, um, but what we have done is gone into to agreement with CKC, where basically we will be reimbursing them for the cost of this program. They will currently be giving us um, initially 80 slots because they only have 60 um, students currently signed up. I do believe as soon as parents know that this is a free program, um, that we will have um, extension of that. So eventually this allows us to go up to 160 slots. Um, for that site. So again, our goal is to do 50% of the current population, and that would be 160 at that site. And so we're asking for agreement. We feel that the parents have been very happy with CKC, and um, we find that they're great partners, and we want to continue to par partner with them. Are there any speakers? Uh, no speakers to this item. Okay, any questions or discussion? Make a motion to approve. No second. I, I actually have a question. So um, my kids went to Valencia, and I needed after-school care for them and um, sent them to a school um, on Trout Gulch Road called Magic Apple. During the pandemic, Magic Apple had to close down everything. Um, if a, a school like Magic Apple wanted to contract with the district to provide some of these slots, could they do that? I'm just wondering how how other wonderful programs could get access to the same type of opportunity, if it's possible. Yeah, so what we've done is we've tried to have sustainability and consistency with families. So we haven't necessarily introduced additional groups. We have maintained the same groups. Um, this, just to be really transparent, this would, um, remove that possibility. So this would give all the funding to CKC. Um, so if we do approve this then, which is my recommendation, so that we can start April 15th, but um, it would, I mean August, thank you, not April. August 18th, August um, 15th is then we would, um, we wouldn't have the funding source to be able to do um, anybody but CKC, which is who they've used for the last yeah, couple years. Yeah, I'm not trying to derail the process that's already in place here. I'm just wondering wondering in the future if there are other very worthy programs that wanted to know about these opportunities, how do we make that information available so that there is 
sort of a you know um, diversity in the marketplace. You know that we should give other people opportunities when they have you know programs that are excellent. Yeah. So first and foremost, if we have current staff there, we must maintain our own staffing. So in this case, we don't have current staff. Um, so we won't be doing community partners at each and every school site. So those that currently have 21st Century Learning Grants have PVUSD extended learning staff. So we cannot replace that staff with outside partners unless we cannot meet the demand. So that would be the response, is once we see if we cannot meet the demand, then we would be able to turn to fellow partners. So you can give me their information so we have it handy if we need it. Yeah, I'm thinking about that other program that I can't remember the name of that had to close down The too. tutoring group? Yeah, but it was a yeah bigger program yeah. that Michelle Cheney was the ED of. I can't remember the name right this Oh, I'm um, yeah, just talking about um, Youth Now. Yeah, Youth Now. That would have been another good program to, to help support anyway. Okay, thank you. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. Okay, this is item 10.9, our Williams, Williams quarterly report for April, May, and June 2022. Who's presenting for Allison? I will do it. Okay. Because I think it's supposed to be Clint, but he's out of the room. So luckily, we had no um, complaints for Williams. So as we must do each quarter, we're required to show the the any type of uniform complaints that we had. Um, we had no complaints um, with throughout the school district for this past quarter. Um, so we asked for the approval of the of the report. Any speakers? No speakers to this item. Okay. I make a motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. 601. Thank you. Uh, item 10.10, .10, approve the appointment of a teacher on a provisional internship permit. Okay, uh, occasionally we do need to have teachers who work off what's called a PIP or a provisional internship permit. These are teachers who are either entering a program or um, have not yet completed a program but don't yet qualify for an intern, so this allows them to be in a classroom. They have their bachelor's degree, they will have um, support via a mentor at their site as well as uh, additional support um, provided through the new teacher project uh, on occasion and so we are requesting for Nadia to have the PIP granted um, to teach the language arts social studies class at Cesar Chavez. Any speakers? No speakers to this item. Any discussion or questions from the board? I'll move to approve. I'll second. I do have a question. Okay. So last year, the new teacher project um, was very, very late in providing help and mentors for our new teachers or on our campuses. I had a friend who was teaching here and didn't get one until like February or April. So how can we ensure that our, our a teacher like this will actually have somebody working with her? So the new teacher has a, the new teacher project has a certain amount of slots for their um, for the teachers that they that we hire. So I don't know off the top of my head, but this year alone we've hired a hundred and. 35 teachers, not all of them are new. So Melissa and I are working to make sure that all of our brand new teachers, right, are just coming out of college who are have their preliminary credential or teachers in this case who have a PIP or a STIP um, have access. Our teachers who come in and get hired, say, in October or November, sometimes have to wait until January or February for a spot to open up if somebody either graduates or the new teacher project has to find a mentor to take them on. So that's where in our contract we have, and we have some MOUs that for site mentors where we can have uh, you know, maybe someone in that department or someone at another school who's in that department um, can work with this person so that they can have a successful teaching year, want to come back, get in an intern program, and be ready to go. 
So, but actually, Melissa and I've already met this year. So, because we do have an influx of elementary new teachers who are kind of in this case, either a PIP or a STIP or a um, intern credential, or even just have their preliminaries. So, we're making plans. That's great. I just want to really help support um, new teachers who. Yes. Yeah, so might do be we struggling. have a lot of them. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is item 10.11, award of a request for proposals number 1-062022, a supplemental school bus driver services. All right. Uh, good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm here to present the RFP request for proposals for um, supplemental, bus supplemental bus driver services for um, the transportation department. Um, on June 20th, the purchasing department issued the RFP and advertised for it. Um, we received one proposal from Michael's Transportation Services that met all requirements of the RFP um, for MTSS to provide as needed school bus driver services for the PVUSD Transportation Department. And the necessity for this RFP um, is from the planned amount of routes right now stands at 59. Uh, the current bus driver roster is at 46. Um, so that leaves 13 vacant routes. And um, MTS services are requested to ensure that as many routes as possible are covered. Um, r available routes are always offered to our staff before an MTS driver is contacted to fill that route. Um, but just to ensure that routes are not run or need to be canceled, um, we are asking for your approval to enter into a three-year agreement with Michael's Transportation um, to provide those services. Any speakers? Yes, no speakers to this item. Any discussion or questions from the board? No. I have one, too. Go ahead. Um, so, I, as a you know, this person who had a, a student at Aptos Junior High, I was constantly getting the texts last year about, you know, it's like, okay, bus route canceled, bus route canceled. And I did hear from quite a number of my constituents saying, it's like, this is really having an impact. So is this contract to, you know, help mitigate, you know, some of that, that particular issue? Yeah. Um, I'm sure that MTS is experiencing some of the same shortages that we right. are. Um, on average, last year they were providing four to five drivers, and then the transportation department was supplementing um, routes with their fuelers and their trainers and their right. dispatchers. Their supervisors sometimes were driving bus routes, so they're really trying to get as many op viable options available as possible to have all of those routes. Filled. And we are also continuing to try and develop our in-house classified staff to develop to, to work on this, correct? To fill the routes? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, currently, there are four drivers being trained. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to be a challenge to get. I, I think it's it's easy to get them in the door to start the process. It yeah. seems very difficult to get them to move all the way through the process. I think they had ten start and four are on track right now to be fully licensed by, I think, the end of September. And so with the way this is worded, it's like it's a, a total fee not to exceed. That doesn't mean we're committed to that total. That is just our cap, correct? That is the so cap. So if we don't need it, like if we can have, if we can hire, you know, you know, our, our own internal drivers, we don't have to use all of that. Correct? Absolutely, we pay as a school district. Everything's built in so that we are only paying for the services we receive. Right. So if we need a driver, we say MTS. We need three drivers today. They show up. They invoice us for the three days or three routes that those drivers work. It's never going to be that we're giving them this amount up front or. Right. It's, it's only for the services that they provide when we request it. So this is basically to ensure that we have a stop gap while we're trying to build. Correct. And it, and it helps us, it helps us work with MTS to make sure that they have drivers available to us. They know that they have an agreement with us to, to provide um, as often as we need them. And, Thank you. and I just wanted to note, we have been using them for the last two and a half years. So if we were not to use them, the situation would be much worse than last year, not better. We had eight vacancies last year. We have 13 anticipated this year. 
and we are doing everything we can to bolster that but I just want to note that we the conditions of last year of us having to cancel routes um, convert routes would actually be worse next year not better um, if we I mean, already it's going to probably be worse because we went from eight to 13. Um, but we would, um, it would be frankly undoable to be able to get kids to school the first day of school if we did not use them. I just have a quick question. Yeah, Tristy Roscoe. Um, so I know also with the, the um, extended learning for after school and before care, I'm assuming that this, the, the uh, this contract also takes that into consideration, right? Because there are going to be parents, some of the parents will be dropping off at a certain location, and obviously we will have to pick up those kids and then drop them off at their schools. Yeah. So that we've already added into the route because it was just a singular mm -hmm. location, so we're okay with that. Okay. Um, we have included in the routes that was mentioned, we have included our after-school um, program routes. So that is included in there. Thank you. Trustee Dodge. I have a question. So you've been saying for the last two years we've been using Michaels? It's come to the board since 2020. And so why are we using a three-year deal instead of continuing to use a year by year? What's the difference? So for the amount that we've used them, it, it triggers kind of a, a bid limit situation where it's, um, it's required by law that we would issue an RFP, formally advertise it, score it, and, and award a contract. So um, knowing that MTS was really the only provider in the area that responded and having the relationship that we already have with them, um, it would be a matter of us doing that same process year after year after year and, um, and having to advertise for it go through the process of scoring it, awarding it. Um, so yeah, it's um, what we're, we're required to do for the amount of money that we've spent for these services. And have CC and the bus drivers been aware of this agenda item tonight? Um, I can't speak to if they were aware of it. The, um, the drivers that MTS has provided, um, I know over the last year, were um, a presence in the yard throughout the year. They, they were providing the same four to five drivers um, consistently. They come in and they get trained by our staff on the routes that they're gonna drive. Um, they have the same kind of check-in processes with, with the transportation supervisors and, and office staff. Um, I don't believe that it is a surprise that, that we've been using MTS drivers or we'll continue to use MTS drivers. Yeah. I just bring it up because uh, for some reason I was contacted by a few people saying they were unaware of this agenda item and with CCA being out on their conferences, uh, a lot of people are worried about what's happening with this and so with that being said, I'd like to make a motion that we continue to have it year by year until CCA could come back and talk about it a little bit more. And so I would like to make that motion this evening. I think the, I, what I would say is it takes tremendous staff time in order to be able to do the RFP. This, and we, we did have a conversation with CSEA around 5.30 p.m. this, this evening. Um, and so it was, it was fairly short, but um, what I would say is this allows us to do it just as needed. So we can stop using them at any time if we want. Um, but for me, it would be a challenge knowing that we only had one person even submit a bid to make the staff do all the work in which it was. Um, 
it's been we've used we've had conversations about using Michael pretty frequently I'll give you an example we needed 20 drivers this summer and could not get them so we use Michael's transportation for that so we have consistently been using Michael's drivers either driving our buses um, in some cases or driving theirs it's a it's a combination um, but um, I would love to be able to say that we are going to be able to solve the problem of our bus driver shortage. But as you hear statewide um, and nationally, you know, people are are paying parents to drive buses. Um, California has a higher standard um, for school bus drivers, as they should. But um, I don't anticipate not having um, a shortage for the next couple of years, even with our robust training. Um, and so just for the public to be aware, we are um, one of the only school districts I know that, that provides a $5,000 training for free to our not yet staff. And then we, two years ago, I believe it was, maybe it was three, um, did the behind the wheel pay as well. So even when they're training with us, we now pay them to try to maintain them. And even with all that, um, it's hard to get a license. So it, we had 10 that started and four that we hope will end end up and that's we don't even know that yet because they haven't taken the CHP um, so I'd, I'd request that it maintains a three-year the thing that has to happen is we need to pass this because bef because the next board meeting is not before the first day of school and it would mean we would not be able to transport all of our students um, I, mean, I know Michael does great work and you know I, I've talked to someone who has an autistic son he, he talks about how great Michael's is all I'm saying is if we could just continue at least one more year, just a contract for one more year, let the bus drivers come back, and th that's all I'm saying. So I'm just keeping my motion on the floor. Thank you. Another question. Okay. Jen Shocker. So if we did not approve this contract tonight, it would mean that we have kids not making it to school the first day of school. Okay. And um, last year, do you know approximately how many times we had to cancel routes um, due to shortages of drivers? It was, it was daily. It was daily. It was different routes, but it was pretty close to daily, especially on Mondays and Fridays. I would say it was every Monday and Friday because we had the vacancies and then we had absences on top of that. And that after, just so that it's people are aware, boards aware of why we could get them there, but we couldn't get them back, is we were utilizing our fuelers, our mechanics, our supervisors, and they can only legally drive so many CHP hours or so many hours per CHP. So if you had a fueler at 6:30 in the morning doing a route, you could not have them do the route back home at 5:30 p.m. And so that's why some of I, we had a lot of parents ask, I don't understand, you got them there, how come you can't get them back home? And it's due to the amount of hours that they're allowed to be behind the wheel. Um, and so this, is, this also provides us with some flexibility. You may remember that originally, so this started, you, just to help recollect, we started with Michaels when we were doing the safe spaces. You may remember we started when we were in the middle of the pandemic and doing the safe spaces. And um, at, and then for this past year, we actually asked up to 15, and they were only able to provide us because they have a shortage as well of four to five um, a day. So, okay. And as stated, we only pay for drivers that we use, correct? And then our um, current drivers have the first choice in routes if their routes are available. Okay, and you said we have 13 vacancies right now, correct? Yeah, 59 planned routes right now and a roster of 46 drivers. So that means that there's 13 routes that don't have drivers right now. So that affects um, an average of how many children would that affect? Um, 
So it depends on the number of students. Um, the av our regular buses are about have about 60 to 70 in them, but not all buses are full. Okay, and um, so we have 13 openings. What have we done to advertise our bus driver openings? Um, I know for me, I've seen we have signs around town still that we're recruiting and providing training for um, to be a bus driver. Um, but um, besides that, I believe our... Uh, yeah, I can speak to it. Um, we have been actively recruiting. We actually did uh, last year even provide a signing bonus to try and entice drivers. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is, as it's been mentioned by the board before, the Metro ends up getting a lot of those drivers, and it's not just due to the signing bonus they offer or the pay they offer. The requirements to be a Metro driver are much lower than to be a school bus driver. So unfortunately, a lot of individuals we've seen even go through our program have trouble actually passing the program because of the specific requirements for school bus drivers. So we see them end up going to some place like the Metro and that's just unfortunately California Highway Patrol law, we can't avoid it. Um, but we have been advertising on EdJoin constantly. Again, Katie's been um, really diligent in trying to get people into her training program. She talks to her drivers, she meets with them monthly. All of her staff encourages people to let people know, come drive. We have great benefits, look at our benefits. That's one of the pieces I know the board is aware of. Um, if you look at a family package for us for a bus driver, it's actually about $21 an hour extra they're making in benefits. So it's hard to show that when you look at a salary and say, I don't make that much an hour, you're making up to $21 an hour in benefits, which is where it's difficult to compete with some companies that are able to pay solely salaries because they have lower benefits. Clint, um, just elaborate for us uh, what the actual salary is, like what's the range? Where does it start and and how does, do you know how, if you know how it compares to MST? I know that, uh, or M, what, the Metro, I, I know that they were, um, they had a, I think a four or $5,000 signing bonus last year. So while he's looking that up, just something for you to know is you probably have seen our commercials as well. So we have our commercials that has actually has me coming out of a bus. So it, ha it talks about teachers, bus drivers, and other staff. So that is at um, Green Valley Cin Cinema. So I have a lot of <laughs> students that said, I saw you at the cinema. Um, Green Valley Cinema, it's on KSBW, Telemundo, Univision. Um, and so we are, we do try um, hard to do that. We also, I'm, I'm on radios, both English and Spanish, so um, we are broadcasting pretty, pretty far and wide. Um, we are now on um, doing things like um, LinkedIn as well and other areas, just trying to make sure that we can access as many people as possible. So our bus drivers range from um, 17 14 an hour up to 21 88 an hour. Um, so when you look at it with, with the actual cost that we pay with statutories and then benefits, bus drivers cost us around $50 an hour. If you look at the Michaels Transportation, they're charging about $65 an hour noting they are a business who needs to make money as well. So realistically, they're not spending more than $50 an hour in total comp on their bus drivers. So we're comparable to what Michaels offers. It just may be they're seeing it in salary, whereas we're seeing it in benefits. So unfortunately, that's, as the board knows, that's what happens with our classified staff often. Yeah, I think this is a negotiable item, so I won't say more than that, but honestly, we need to be more competitive, likely, on the salary side, so thank you. Oh yeah, go ahead, Trustee Soto. So, looking at the budget for this item, it's at about 1.2, and the next agenda item is for a similar RFP, but just for a different type of vehicle at uh, 1.4, so it's a little over two and a half million between the two contracts. So is there any way that we could, and uh, is this money already budgeted and allocated for this? So they're standing 
they're standing uh, funds for this? Yeah, so effectively for um, this one, not as much for the next one, because the next one's a joint, which is specifically for some of our really difficult um, to fill routes or our students where we're taking them over the hill. But for this one, the funding really ends up coming from our vacancies that are in transportation. So each time we don't fill a position in transportation, we're saving budgeted money from that position. If we were to fill all of our positions, that of course would be the money that would be used for this contract because it would actually end up going to CSEA members that we hired. So right now we have 13 vacancies. If you think that 13 vacancies, each vacancies close to probably about 75,000, that's the majority of it. The other, and again, that's over, that's for one year. One year of 13 vacancies is gonna be, and again, trying to do quick math, $750,000. This is also over the course of three years what we would be looking at. So over three years, if we had 13 vacancies, we would be saving about $2.25 million in budget. So is there any way to spread this money or apply it? Like Trustee DeSerpa mentioned that you know we do need to make a, a stand and have a more attractive uh, pay scale. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez, when I was here as a maintenance supervisor out in this very parking lot, I remember you asking me when you first came on, um, what would it take to keep people or to retain people, you know, what, and as far as pay? And I, and I mentioned to you, it'd probably take about 20% of an increase. And this was, we probably had this conversation probably over five years ago at the time. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of putting it out there as far as the budgeted money to apply it, you know, to pay to make it more attractive. I mean, granted, you're saying that attrition, you know, is kind of taking people out of the program, four out of 10 that are completing it. So maybe we can uh, improve upon the recruitment pool with that pay increase and have more uh, different level of a driver employee. So two pieces. One is we are currently in negotiations with CSCA, so we met with them um, a couple weeks ago to start negotiations. We are negotiating for them for both the 21-22 year as well as out years. So we, we can definitely negotiate salary. Unfortunately, we couldn't use this funding to provide just a salary increase because then once we filled those 13 vacancies, we would now have roughly you know, $800,000, $900,000 that we did not budget because we used the budgeted money from the vacancies to give an increase and then have to fill the vacancies. So the vacancies really are just, it's money that we are budgeting in case we fill, as we always do, because we have to fill all, all of our vacancies. Um, so that money's not really able to be used for anything else. Using that money for anything but those vacancies would mean uh, saying that we're eliminating those 13 vacancies, which I know we don't want to do. Yeah, and and to, to further comment, I mean, don't get me wrong, I mean, my genuine concern are the kids and, and we do have to get them to school and we have to have the services available. I mean, that, that's our number one, that's gonna be my number one. But, um, you know, also personnel is to keep this place functioning. Tristy Holm. I just wanted to add, you know, a couple more thoughts. Is one I've heard, you know, over and over and over again from uh, from union leadership, from my constituents, that they wanted more and more efficiency in management. And if we're asking a repetitive RFP cycle, that's not efficiency in management. And if Michaels is the game that's in town, they're the game that's in town. If we have a three-year proposal from them, then that's not taking staff time, redo redoing a process that we know is basically redundant. It means that they have more time to get to the root cause and get more union jobs on board. So, Okay, so we did have a motion by um, Trustee Dodge. If, um, if there's no second, then we'll move on. So um, Trustee Dodge, I regret to inform you, I don't hear a second on your motion, so the motion will die. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to approve this um, RFP as presented by administration? Move to approve. 
second. Yeah, with the understanding that you know this is an as-needed basis for mm -hmm. personnel and the kids to get them where they need to be, um, and then well, negotiations will dictate the rest. Uh, I approve. Right. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? I opposed to it elected for your concept. Okay. Yeah. Understood. Um, motion carries. Um, five one one. Thank you. Um, similarly, this is item 10.12, award of a request for proposal number 2-06-2022, Alternative Transportation Services for PBUSD students. All right, uh, good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, RFP for Alternative Transportation Services was just issued by the Purchasing Department on June 20th. Um, a total of two proposals were received from Adroit Advanced Technologies and Leftridge Transportation. The proposals were evaluated by district administration, and the purpose of this RFP is to request servants to services for instances in which a student who cannot ride uh, the traditional yellow school us um, for a variety of reasons would be able to have safe and reliable transportation to schools that are within or outside of PVUSD. Um, on a typical day, these services are needed uh, anywhere from five to eight times, and um, adroit technologies advanced technologies will only be used on an as-needed basis, and they will provide transportation services in either sedans, uh, large vehicles being probably uh, that would be regular passenger vans or wheelchair vans if necessary, and these services will not be used to replace any PVUSD drivers. Um, this agreement is also for an initial three-year term with the option to renew it for an additional two years, and it is for the not to exceed amount of $1,400,000, and we're asking for your approval to enter into this agreement. Are there any speakers, Trustee Shocker? There are no speakers. Okay. Any questions from the board? Uh huh. Okay. I'm looking for a motion to approve. I'll move to approve. A second. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Looks like the motion carries. Um, five. No. Five. Sorry. Five zero two. Oh yeah, sorry. Five zero two with Georgia Costa absent and Mary Rusco away from her seat. Thank you. Ten point one three award of request for proposal number three, um, z zero six twenty twenty two, hazardous material inventory removal and training services. All right, good evening once more. Uh, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this request for proposals for um, hazmat inventory removal and training services uh, was issued by the Purchasing Department on June 20th. A uh, total of two proposals were received from uh, Keenan and Associates and School Safety Solutions. And the purpose of this RFP is to find a service provider for on site inventory and labeling of all um, items that have a safety data sheet. So that's everything from um, a glue stick all the way up to cleaning chemicals that are used um, throughout a school. Uh, the service provider will be reporting on the quantities and locations where they find these items and they would prep any, prepare any of the items that are expired or not authorized to be on a school site for removal and um, destruction. They will also provide training services for PVUSD staff on safety, handling and storage of chemicals. And the initial term for this agreement um, uh, our selection is Keenan, um, and we've never worked with them for these types of services. So as a new vendor, we felt two years was appropriate to send them through, um, you know, one school year and then another one to um, really evaluate the service they're providing. And um, the total not to exceed amount for their agreement is $97,012. And we ask for your approval to enter in this, into this agreement. Any speakers? There are no speakers to this item. Okay, any questions? 
Who have we? I'm sorry. I think I might have missed what you said, but who have we used in the past for? So it was students? actually the other, the other proposal of school safety solutions, uh -huh. um, and the committee that evaluated them included purchasing, uh, maintenance and operations, custodial staff, and risk and safety. Um, the services were were similar. The um, Keenan is somebody we work with for. Um, Gosh, risk and safety works with them. Uh, workers comp, they evaluate uh, ergonomics. They, they, they're, they're very much entrenched with us for safety solutions for our district. And um, they had a very attractive method of tracking these uh, types of transactions for chemicals of where they're located and how much of them are on site, how much of them are being destroyed and removed. And um, they were, um, I think a, a good fit for what we're trying to do to have more access to that information and be able to share it with sites and, and know what kinds of items we have on site. Are there like yearly like videos that they watch and have to? So um, Keenan will actually be doing the, the trainings in person. Um, so there are lots of different ways that they train. They do assign um, lots of different videos for us for, um, for training during the year. But for this specific agreement, they would be on site working directly with our staff on how to um, label, store, and yeah. manage these types of materials. Because some of them, like I said, are glue sticks, classroom items that really truly do have SDS sheets and a method for how to dispose of them, what to do if, if you get it in your eye, right? All the way up to stuff that you shouldn't be touching unless you're completely covered in PPE. Um, so it's a very um, important service to have and yeah, required by law, yeah, yeah etc. Okay, great. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And motion carries 601. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item 10.14, Cruzeo Network Distribution Equipment Site Joint Agreement Addendum. Hi, Dan. Good, good hello. Good, uh, good evening, President Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, this is our third addendum to the agreement that we have with Cruzio for internet infrastructure on our campuses. This is to add infrastructure to a Mesty and Bradley school to provide internet services to the community. Um, and as you know, that's free and low cost ideally free and usually free and continues to be free uh, as they receive funds from various um, sources, grants and other things. Um, so this will ex extend their reach and their ability to provide those internet services for our families. So I'm asking for your approval to uh, uh, make this addendum to our agreement. Uh, any speakers? No speakers. Okay, uh, any questions or discussion? So I do have a question. So there had been a proposal with um, the county to run a high-speed underground, right, lines, um, right, up Freedom. Did that happen? And so there, I know they're expanding um, fiber connections um, throughout the county, uh, and there's a variety of different processes and, and programs that are in place for that. Um, and I know that there's ongoing extensions and expansions to existing fiber networks. Um, that's not necessarily all connected through Cruzio, and it's not part of this infrastructure, but our hope is always that they're going to extend those services out to areas that need it so that there are high-speed internet options for families that live in parts of the county that don't currently have those services. Um, so those extensions are good news. Um, uh, and then how the you know various various providers can share some of that um, fiber network depending on how it's produced and where it's where it's serviced. I think this would be good for um, a future agenda item. I'd like Cruzio people to come here and talk to us about what the plans are. Okay, you, yeah, yeah. as far as county county wide uh, internet well, opportunities. Well, in particular or? to the Pajaro. Valley and to the Aptos areas that are very rural. I'd like to know what's going on, what's new, and and what the what the plans are, right. and what's okay. been completed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and just you mean as far as various service providers and and what what infrastructure is in, yeah. in place for those? Yeah, access and yeah. equity. Right. Yeah. Okay. Sounds okay. Good. So no speakers to this. Um, I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries six zero Thank one. You. Thank you.
sorry, my computer went to sleep again. 10.15 school plans for student achievement 2022-2023. Good evening, President De Serpa, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, tonight, I once again have the privilege of presenting you with this year's school plans for student achievement. Um, as you know, each year sites are required to prepare a plan um, that identifies the goals that are linked to LCAP goals. These plans are designed based on the continuous improvement cycle with the ultimate goal that students are reaching and achieving their greatest potential, um, including proficiency in state standards. Um, the symptoms are documents that change on an ongoing basis based on a site's analysis of how they're doing and meeting their goals and implementing their strategies. And that's where the cycle of continuous improvement comes in. Some key requirements are that they go through their um, teams, their various, their various parent advisory committees. Um, English Learner Advisory Committee uh, gets an ongoing opportunities to monitor the implementation of the strategies and the progress toward, towards meeting the goals and makes re recommendations to their school site councils. School site councils do the same ongoing monitoring and then ultimately, um, while re uh, receiving input from ELAC, make the decision to approve um, their proposed SIPSA for the year. Um, as you know, we have four expectations for sites that are aligned to our LCAP goals, academic achievement, English learner progress, school culture, and parent and family engagement. Um, one thing of note that's new in this presentation is that um, as of now, all schools have been identified as Title I school-wide schools. The purpose of the school-wide program is to improve academic achievement throughout a school so that all students, particularly the lowest achieving students, demonstrate proficiency on the state's academic standards. Um, this won't affect funding for schools currently designated as school-wide. Um, it simply allows flexibility in how we increase supplemental support supports district-wide. Um, schools not formerly identified as school-wide already meet all the requirements to move forward with this new designation because we've always held the expectation that those schools are also doing the, um, the, the SIPSAs. Um, and then the next steps, um, once this is approved by the local governing board, is that the plan can be implemented um, for the next effective year. And that includes the cycle, or continues the cycle with monitoring the implementation and analyzing student data. Um, one thing that is new based on your requests in the past is this new snapshot. And I have hard copies for you, but basically what I asked is that the principals put together a quick one-pager on just a quick snapshot of what their goals are and the changes that were made based on the ongoing monitoring. Um, so the slides are in there, but I also have hard copies for all of you. And as I pass it out, I will happily take questions. We have no speakers for this item. Thank you. Thank you. Can you say more about what you mean by ongoing monitoring? Like how were, why were the goals changed and who does the monitoring? And yeah, absolutely. So I'll go back to the cycle here. Um, what we expect sites to do and we require from sites, um, rather than just a one-time look at data, how did we do on meeting our goals, what do we need to change, we have two cycles throughout the year um, where, where sites are expected to um, continually review and monitor whether or not each strategy is being implemented to fidelity and how they are doing with that implementation. So throughout the year, sites are, are required to either modify or maintain goals based on that monitoring. So as different data comes in throughout the year um, and as different conferences, PD opportunities, um, positions, have, as things change, um, that's, that's analyzed and decided how we're, gonna, how we're gonna update that. For example, if a, if a position isn't filled, um, like a, an IA position and all of a sudden halfway through the year it doesn't look like it's gonna get filled, we have that, those, that, those budgetary items, uh, maybe we're gonna change that to, um, to, to more collaboration for teachers or PD or something like that. So 
So I don't see any outcomes here. Some of them did. This is a new thing that we're trying, and um, it was the end of the year, and so some of them got the message that the outcomes are intended, um, and some of them did not, so they just kind of put their goals, the, the, the new goals. So I see the goals, and then the next steps are is that like some like halfway through the year the next steps go into those play? Are, those are those are some of the key points that they're changing based on the monitoring cycles sorry i'm monopolizing the conversation is there anyone else who might have any <laughs> questions or discussion so you know we like outcomes yeah so it's hard to know why the goal changed because it doesn't say there's a problem right. here and this is why the goal changed. Yeah. This really, I mean, it's nice to see this and I can imagine why the goal changed, but I don't actually know. Right. Uh, at these. If you look at Minty White, I think that's going to be the exemplar for what my expectations are for next year. So, so we, uh, I, di I didn't get a chance to hit him up because it was a late, it was a late throw in on this one, um, and a lot of people were at um, va on vacation. So, I think that's. A a good example of where we're going with this uh, this report for you all. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate this, despite my criticism. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you saying it. it last year. I know. I'm going to read it cover to cover. <laughs> no, it's great, and it was a lot of work. So, not just putting it together, but the team at the school. So yeah. Thank Thank you to all the teachers and staff. Um, okay, and this is something, are we approving this? This is an action? Ah, uh, please. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll um, make a motion to approve. Mm -hmm. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 601. Thank you. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Item 10.16, MAP Accelerator Renewal. Good evening, Hi. President Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I have the opportunity this evening uh, to bring forward the MAP Accelerator for your approval for the 22-23 school year. Um, as a reminder, a MAP Accelerator, uh, we were one of five districts in the nation that was selected to do the pilot in the year 2019-2020. Uh, um, and we were selected due to our use of the math MAP Growth Assessment. Um, and so we looked at prelimin preliminary data and it was very promising. Um, and then we went into COVID and we continue to use MAP Accelerator and um, we are looking forward to using it next year. As what happens is that students take the MAP Growth Assessment and based on the score that they receive on the math portion, the RIT, then um, lessons and activities are automatically sent to the student based, at, based on where they are are, um, and to help them accelerate their math if they're below. It helps them learn if they're above, they'll have um, math at their level. Teachers have the ability to say, yes, that's what I want students to do, or they can override it and push other lessons out to students. Um, what is shown is that students, if they complete 60% of the math grade level that's pushed out to them, they should have an expected growth of 1.8. What this means is that each student, they take the test in the fall, based on their score, they're going to have an expected growth by the end of the year, right? So it's based on the own student score. Students who complete the MAP Accelerator, um, about 60%, then what um, takes place is that they have 1.8 times that expected growth. And that expected growth is about a year's growth, right? So which means that they're growing more than a year's time within a year. Our current schools um, that used it this past year um, are up on the board. The three schools that are not are at, uh, Amesti, which is using ST Math, K through five, um, Starlight, which is using ST Math, and then Pajaro Middle School, which has Alex. So those are the only three schools that you do not see. So this looks complicated, but it's not gonna be complicated. What I want you to focus on is the horizontal X axis. Okay, so the horizontal x-axis where you have the orangish yellow and the green box above it, what we wanna see is we wanna see those crosses above that line. That means they're meeting above expected growth. 
Okay, so that line is expected growth. Now this is a classroom, okay, so not all students did their weekly minutes, so you're gonna have a smattering, but um, what we wanna see is that with it, 80% of the students that met their expected growth were above or 80% of the students that completed their week average weekly minutes that they're supposed to were above their expected growth. And then in this actual classroom example, 100% of the students that did not meet their, their weekly minutes were, in, were on the lower range where they did not have a lot of growth. So that was the, the converse of it. Um, on the right-hand side, this is just an actual student that we're gonna go more in depth with. So this student that we see here, this is an actual example, came in in the fall at a 185, which is in the lowest percentile band. But based on the, the usage, and they um, had, what they, she did 80% of what was um, expected of her, and, um, and she had uh, 1.7 times the amount of growth. So she did, she did really well. And so if you look, she's no longer in the lowest percentile band, she's almost at the next. And that's what we want to see. So we have students that are below, but the more that they move past the one year's growth, the higher they're going to go until they reach the green band, which is at grade level. This is a different classroom, and within this classroom, same thing, the 50th percentile. Not all students were able to do the weekly amount of minutes. You have a, um, a variety of students who, with their growth. Within um, this classroom, we had 86% um, of the students that met their weekly minutes on Map Accelerator had higher than average growth. We're gonna look at an example of a student who's in the green over here, which in the green here, which means they're at grade level. This student um, did 63% and they had two times the amount of growth. And so where they started at the fall was almost is at the border of the um, second to lowest percentile band to the yellow band, and they were able to get up to on grade level by the end of the school year with, um, by having the prescribed minutes of MAP Accelerator. And so we do believe with the studies and the things that we are seeing that MAP Accelerator is a program that truly is individualized based on student needs and helps students accelerate their math learning and meets them where they are. And so with this, um, I, staff, ask for your approval of the MAP Accelerator program for the 2022-23 school year. We have no speakers to this item. Questions or discussion from the board? Trustee Holm. When, um, when you talk about students not being able to meet their expected minutes, what, what does that mean? Is that in the classroom? Is it at home? Is, you know, what kind of factors have a student not meeting their minutes? Um, it could be both. It all depends on how the teachers use it within the classroom, whether they carve out time within the classroom or they're expecting students to do it at home and then the follow-up. Through what we're finding is that when um, there was a usage drop-off coming back from the pandemic and it's everybody just trying to get back into the routines. So this year we are going to do, with all of our digital programs, including um, Map Accelerator, we are going to do a lot of follow-up and um, reminders to both the um, administrators and the teachers because we know the programs work. We just have to make sure that the students are using them. Nope. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. I think it's a great, I have a comment. Um, I think it's a great idea to use this program and um, I, I don't understand why this isn't like being strongly implemented by our principals. We're, like I said, there was a lot with coming back last year. There was a lot on the site's plates in terms of all the, the health regulations and everything else, so some of the things did yeah. fall out of okay. practice. So this year there will be a strong implementation with yeah, our site. We had such strong growth in literacy that I would really, really, before I, I retire from this board, <laughs> I would really like to see a strong growth in math. I agree. I mean, that is like a dream come true. I agree. Yeah, okay, thank you. A first and a second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone thank opposed? You. Motion carries. Thank you. 601, thank you.
item 10.17, Greenfield Learning Partnership. Good evening, Dr. De uh, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Get my doctors all mixed up here. Um, I'm Claudia, Director for Language Arts. Um, so we are going to flip over to literacy right now, and I'm bringing to you our, oh, here's the thing, our Greenfield Learning Par Partnership contract that we would like to have. So in the past, what we've done is Lexi and Greenfield were actually partnered together, and so our contract was just one contract for both. And Lexia, just to remind folks, is the company that has Core 5 that we use at the elementary level in K through 5. And it also includes Power Up, which is grades 6 through 8. So um, what's happened now is that Lexia and Greenfield have split. So what we'd like to be able to do is because um, we still have our, our Lexia contract, but we'd like to actually initiate a contract specifically with Greenfield Learning. We've started to work with them um, this last year. Oops, right here. Um, started to work with them last year around our middle school implementation of Power Up. So um, if we can do the Greenfield Learning contract, that will give us the ability to continue working around science of reading and any other leader, um, shifts we need to do instructionally in the classroom around the My Perspectives curriculum. Um, the contract does include two levels of support. So we have the district level partnership. So that would mean six um, meetings over the course of the school year with um, our district level team. And um, where we are setting our goals, um, they're helping us figure out how to support the sites. Um, they also have the ability to come to at least two of our PD sessions to help support with those. And more importantly, at the site level, we do have, um, it would give us six virtual partnerships with each site. So we're talking the six middle schools and each one gets six meetings over the course of the year. Purpose of that would be with administrators, they would be setting goals at the beginning of the year, laying out their plan, um, how, how are they going to incorporate it into the um, language arts instructional time so that all students are getting access to it, to power up. Um, and then um, also doing PD with the administrators around science of reading, and then also with the department chairs as well. So trying to do the training and lift with um, our leads and our admin, and then hopefully you'd see me back here next year, and we'd be asking to do it with teachers. So with that, I'm asking for approval on the Greenfield Learning Contract. Any speakers? No speakers to this item. Okay, any questions or comments, discussion? I have a, just a quick okay. question to clarify. So Lexia is maintaining the core five? Yes. And then Greenfield is now doing the power up the middle school? No, That's Lexia. That's a little confusing. Lexia is the, yeah, I know. Okay. Well, part of that is because people say Lexia when they're talking about Core 5. five. Mm -hmm. So Lexia is the actual company, and within that company is Core 5 and Power Up. Okay. Those two are Lexia programs. Okay. Greenfield Learning is its own separate company, and what they do is they are now focusing in on specifically professional development around literacy. Mm -hmm. So by being able to contract with them, we won't be limited to just power up. We'll actually be able to do strong PD with middle school administrators and department chairs around understanding science of reading and any literacy pieces. They can help us do small group work in middle schools so all of those structures it doesn't tie them to just power up okay so by maintaining the contract with Lexia so we still have access to power up we get the trainings around that particular program but Greenfield's more of the bigger umbrella okay because yeah. Lexia is also based on science of reading correct yes, yes. it is okay mm -hmm. thank you for clarifying that I would that I'd make a motion to approve a second all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 601. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item 10.18, add 45-day budget revision to August 10th special board meeting agenda. 
Yeah, thank you so much. So as we mentioned at the last board meeting, normally the August 10th meeting is reserved just for my evaluation and closed session item. But because of the fact that there has been such a significant shift in the proposed budget from the governor's proposal to the approved budget, we are required as almost all school districts with large vulnerable populations, we must do a 45 day revise and so because it's required within a certain period of time we cannot wait till the August 24th board meeting and so this is adding an action item um, to the August 10th board meeting so we would have that open session um, 45 day revise and then I think it's just a presentation actually right just a presentation not an action item but a presentation and then we would go into closed session for my evaluation any speakers? No speakers. Okay. Any questions? Discussion? I need a motion. I'll move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Thank you. Motion carries. Okay, next up is our consent agenda. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. Okay. Okay, report out on closed session. All right, so under item 2.1, the board voted with a 511 vote to reject a parent appeal of complaint against an employee as identified in closed session item 2.1. Under item 2.2, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration on July 27th, 2022, with 45 and 21 additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 601. Under item 2.3, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration on July 27, 2022 with 37 and seven additional action items. Move to approve. Oh. Second. 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 Sorry. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries, 601. And then under item 2.6, the board voted with a 601 vote to reject the claim identified in closed session item 2.6. And then uh, we have a couple of announcements. A couple. 14. <laughs> All right, <laughs> announcement number one. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Rebecca Milburn as a new principal at McQuitty Elementary School. Rebecca has been serving students since 1992 as a classroom teacher, intervention teacher, EL specialist, and most recently as the academic coordinator at McQuitty Elementary. She holds a master's degree and an and, and administrative credential from Concordia University and a bachelor's of arts in Spanish and Latin American studies from Cal State Chico. She's also obtained her multiple subject credential along with a Spanish bilingual authorization from UCSC. We're excited to welcome Rebecca to her new role. Go Mustangs. Announcement number two. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Susan Gralty as the new principal of New School. Sue has been working with students since 2002 when she started her career as, a, as an instructional aide in Fishers, Indiana. Since then, she has worked as a substitute teacher, a fifth grade teacher, social studies, and PE teacher, as well as an instructor in the juvenile justice system. She has been the coordinator of BAPA and Gate Services for the last six years at PBUSD. Sue has a love of music and served as a professional flutist in the Illinois Air National Guard for 16 years. We're excited to welcome Sue to her new role. Go Aztecs. Announcement number three. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Patricia Enroux. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. 
as the new coordinator of extended learning for migrant education. Trish holds a degree in biopsychology from UCSB as well as multiple subject credential with Spanish and bilingual authorization. She also holds a Master of Arts in Educational Leadership from SJSU along with an administrative credential. She has been serving students since 1992 when she was a science naturalist for an outdoor school. She has since been a bilingual teacher, literacy coordinator, and a migrant teacher for after school programs. We're excited to have her step into her new role as a coordinator of migrant and extended learning. Announcement number four. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Esmeralda Flores as the new academic coordinator of Refcliffe Elementary. Esme is a graduate of Paro Valley High and attended CSUMB, where she earned her bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and her credentials, both for multiple subjects and administration. She has been working with students since 2007 as a student helper with the extended learning program. She moved into her teaching role in 2014 at Radcliffe Elementary and has been working there for the last Last eight years. It is exciting to see a PBSD graduate take on a leadership role in our, in our district. We're excited to welcome Esme to her new role. Go Dragons! Announcement number five. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Rachel Jones as the new assistant principal at Aptos High School. Rachel has been working with students in a variety of ways since January of 2006 when she began her career teaching at Aiea Middle School in Hawaii. She has since been a teacher at an alternative school, special education in PBUSD, and was recently as a new teacher mentor with the New Teacher Project. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science from University of Hawaii, as well as a master's degree from the same university. She earned her special education credential and her administrative credential from CSUMB. We're pleased to welcome Rachel to her new goal, new role. Go Mariners. Announcement number six. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Jorge Bermudez. Jorge is a graduate of Paro Valley High and has most recently been a teacher at New School. Before that, he taught sixth and seventh graders in Washington State. He also served as the lead academic intern for the Gear Up program at Watsonville High. He holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology from UCSC and is currently working on completing his Master's in Educational Leadership from CSUMB. Once again, we're excited to see our PVUSD graduates take on leadership roles in their communities. We're pleased to have Jorge in his new role. Go Bobcats! Announcement number seven. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Judith Woods as the new Assistant Principal of Lakeview Middle School. Judith has been working with students since 2003, with all of those years being dedicated to Lakefield Middle School. During this time, she has served as an activities director, department chair, Washington DC trip lead teacher, and has served on the site leadership team. She has a bachelor's of arts from UCSC in modern literature and a teaching credential from CSUMB. She earned her, she earned her administrative credential from, liter, from the leaders in educational administration program through Santa Clara County. We're pleased to have this experience education continue her journey. This experienced educator continue her journey with Lakeview Middle School. Go Eagles. Announcement number eight. There's a lot of announcements. This is exciting. Uh, announcement number eight. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Nicole Sales Cunha as one of the new program directors for special education. Nicole has been working with students since 2014 as a special education teacher and instructional coach. She has also been a mentor with the New Teacher Project and most recently was a principal of our Early Childhood Services a Special Education Program. This program entails six Early Childhood Special Education programs across five campuses. Nicole holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Liberal Studies from San Diego State and a Master's in Education leadership from San Diego State as well. Her ed special specialist credential is from CSUMB, while her administrative credential is from San Diego State. We're pleased to have Nicole join the special services team. Announcement number nine. 
The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Philip Menchaca as one of the new program directors for the special education. Philip comes to PVSU with over 20 years of, of education experience. His most recent role saw him serving as a principal with the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. There, he worked as a special education program administrator and site supervisor. He has also served as an alternative program teacher and a site administrator at various schools. Philip holds a Bachelor's of Arts from National University, a multiple subject credential from University of the Pacific, and a Master's in Education from Cal State Stanislaus. He's currently a doctoral candidate with North Central University. We're excited to welcome Philip to his new role. Announcement number 10. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Blanca Marinas Madriz as the new assistant principal of EA Hall Middle School. As with two of our other new administrators, Blanca is a product of PBUSD school system. She graduated from Watsonville High School and then obtained her bachelor's degree in liberal studies from CSUMB, as well as her multiple subject credential. From there, she earned a master's degree in administration and supervision from San Jose State, as well as her administrative services credential. She has been working with PBUSD since 2011 as a reading intervention teacher at Hall District. Her most recent role was serving as the after-school coordinator at Yeh Hall and at Minty White Elementary. We're so excited to see another PBUSD graduate take on a leadership role in their community. Go Falcons! Announcement number 11. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Elizabeth Liz Edinger. 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 Thank you. As the new assistant principal at Absol Junior High School. She, Liz has been serving students since 1998 as, as a Montessori preschool teacher. She has also taught at Shoreline Middle School and has had two stints at Aptos Junior High School since 2004. Her most recent role at Aptos Junior had her teaching computer science and language arts. Liz earned a bachelor's degree in history and a single subject credential from Humboldt State University. She also holds supplemental authorizations in computer science and English language arts. She's currently enrolled in an administrative credential program at San Diego State University. This brings a wealth of experience to her new position and we're excited to have her join the Aptos Junior High administrative team. Go see Dragons. Announcement number 12. On behalf of our superintendent and district administration, we're pleased to announce Mr. Sergio Ambriz, promotion to supervisor maintenance. Supervisor of Maintenance. Mr. Ambriz has worked for the Paro Valley Unified School District for five and a half years as a maintenance specialist with a broad background in various trades such as plumbing, carpentry, and HVAC, to name a few. His knowledge and understanding of the maintenance and operation systems of the district are invaluable. He is skilled at problem solving, safety compliance, and leading construction projects. He cultivates production, productive working relationships and instills confidence and trust in those he works alongside. We're proud to promote Mr. Ambriz to our supervisor of maintenance. He looks forward to serving the district and continuing the good work of improving district facilities in his new role. Announcement number 13. On behalf of um, on behalf of our superintendent and district administration, we're pleased to announce Ms. Ginny Aitkins. Thank you. Uh, promotion to Director of Food and Nutrition Services. Uh, Ms. Atkin has over 24 years of experience in food services industry with 13 of those working for, for school food and nutrition. She has served as the supervisor of operations in PBUSD since 2017. She is a strong leader who can take on a project, plan out a timeline, train and guide staff and communicate with all parties during the course of the project to reach a successful outcome. In all of the years in in all of the years in school, food and nutrition, her decisions are always centered on what is best for students. She received an associate's degree in culinary arts and restaurant management at her, and her bachelor's degree in health education from Western Michigan University. She looks forward to serving the district and continuing the good work on improving our food and nutrition programs for students. We're proud to welcome her to her new assignment as Director of Food and Nutrition Services. Announcement number 14. 
On behalf of our superintendents and district administration, we're pleased to announce Mr. John Navaretes. I'm not sure. Appointment to Supervisor of Maintenance. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the last names here. Um, he has worked in the construction trades uh, uh, for his whole career. He brings to the district a vast knowledge of construction trades as well as OSHA safety regulations. He worked for commercial building companies where he supervised staff and led large construction projects. He's a good communicator and up for any challenge. He obtained his bachelor's degree in project management from the University of Nevada at Reno and holds a certification in HVAC and refrigeration. We're proud to announce uh, him as our new supervisor of maintenance. He looks forward to serving the district and bringing his skill set to the district in his new role as one of our supervisors. There you go. Good job, Bruce. <laughs> Thank, thank you to our human resources um, people for all of those wonderful hires and we appreciate all the work that you've put in. Um, our next board meeting will be a special board meeting on August 10th, 2022. I'm guessing that will start at about six o'clock um, per usual and with that we are now adjourned. Thank you.